Pursuant to Section 8414.11 of the Nebraska Statutes, the next regular meeting of the Board of Education of Douglas County School District 0001 and Board of Education Educational Service Unit Number 19 will be held on Monday, July 2nd at 6.30 p.m. in the Board Meeting Room of the Teacher Administrative Center, 3215 Cumming Street. The agenda will be kept current and available for public inspection in the Office of the Secretary of, Edu Secretary of the Board of Education at the Administrative Building during regular working hours. Pursuant to Section 8414.12 of Nebraska Statutes, the public is hereby informed that a current copy of the Nebraska Open Meetings Act is posted in the board meeting room on the north wall. Please stand and join us for the Pledge of Allegiance. Vice President Merica will lead us in the OPS vision and mission statement. First up is our vision, every student, every day prepared for success, and our mission, Omaha Public Schools prepares all students to excel in college, career, and life. Thank you. Roll call, please. Cassidy. Cassidy. Here. Godding. Present. Allman. Present. America. Present. Perlman. Here. Ryan. Present. Scanlon. Present. Smith. Here. Snow. Here. Nine present. Thank you. Um, we're going to reorganize a couple things starting the meeting off. Um, for members of the board and the public, uh, Connie Kanoki is not here today, but her treasurer's report is attached for your review. Um, moving on to superintendent communications, Mr. Evans. Thank you, Mr. Snow. Just a couple of things. Uh, first, uh, just a special thank you to the College World Series, NCAA, and also Creighton University. Today I was with um, six different schools, uh, elementary students from six different schools that were celebrated on the field for the reading program where they're purchasing books for our elementary students across the district. And 
Uh, I also want to give kudos to Clifford, the big red dog, which if you know anything about the heat of a costume, Clifford was out there in 97% humidity and heat, and uh, he didn't pass out, and the kids really enjoyed Clifford. So thank you, Clifford, who, whoever you are. So that was a great day celebrating a great partnership. I also wanted to thank another partner. Uh, we've been able to, with the help of our district technology staff, write a grant to the Sherwood Foundation to update our 13-year-old website. And if you've been on our website, you know that there's work that could be done to it. So a special thank you to the grant and also a thank you to the tech staff that are going to be a part of revamping what really is a huge job because of all the integrated websites to the main website. It's a, just a huge, huge journey. So uh, thank you to all those folks that are involved in that. And then just a reminder to the board that we're looking at uh, sometime in July, beginning to send all of our financials to Moody's and S&P in New York as a result of phase two passing. One of the things we have to get is a bond rating. And so we have to send in all of our financials and uh, basically all the assessed values that are a part of the OPS uh, financial piece. So. Uh, a lot, of, a lot of great work in front of us still, but uh, we're moving the right direction. So uh, thank you, President Snow. Thank you, Mr. Evans. Um, like I mentioned before that we're going to move the agenda around a little bit. Just starting off, we're going to move on to public comment. Um, the next item on the agenda is public comment. We have four speakers who have submitted requests to speak forms. The board has adopted policy 8346, which provides public comment for a period of one hour. That same policy limits individual speakers to a maximum of five minutes. We ask that you respect that time limit. Mr. Ray will let you know when you have one minute remaining and when you have 30 seconds remaining. If you're in need of an interpreter, please let Mr. Ray know and one will be provided for you. If the subject of your public comment is related to a particular student or staff member, we ask that you not mention the student or staff member by name and instead provide that information to Mr. Ray. He will insist us in looking into those types of details for you. If you do not get an opportunity to speak and would like to submit a written commentary, please provide it to Mr. Ray. He will make sure each member of the board gets a copy. As a reminder, we ask that you please spell your name and state your address before you begin your public comment. It is now 636. Our first speaker is Michael Perkins. Uh, Mike. Michael Perkins, M-I-C-H-A-E-L, uh, Perkins, P-E-R-K-I-N-S. I live at 9030 Raven Oaks Drive, Omaha, Nebraska, 68104. I mean 68105, my fault. Here, you can make your comments. Okay, my comment is, uh, like I was at the board meeting, the last board meeting, and uh, Mr. Evans, uh, spoke about how great a kickoff about the bond and how great the first half was, and um, and I was I was agreeing with that, but in order to keep it going, you know this just didn't happen by itself. You know the Jacobs team made this happen, and without them again on the second issue of the bond you might run into difficulties and uh, you know it may not go the same way so I don't see why you would want to change in the middle of the stream you know what I'm saying it's going so great now why change contractors and uh, they have already been into the community and they did community engagements and spoke with everybody in the community and everybody in the community is happy about the way the bond is going right now so I mean I don't see why you would even consider changing from when you got a, a chunk of gold to you know fool's gold and uh, that's all I got to say thank, thank you. you our next speaker is Tina Diaz Chehomsky Um, my name is Tina, T-I-N-A, Diaz, D-I-A-Z, Chahomsky, C-I-E-C-H-O-M-S-K-I. My address is 3113 South 19th Street, um, and zip code is 68108. 
Um, first of all, I'd like to tell, uh, let OPS um, tell them thank you for giving us the opportunity to work on um, many different schools. Um, I've been in business for about 18 years now, so I'm kind of, you know, had a little bit of background, but um, in the last few years, um, after being a part of um, Jacobs and the OPS Academy, um, I was given the opportunity and um, doors were opened up greatly for us. Um, Jacobs has been there along the way. We've worked on four different schools. We've worked on um, Beverage Middle School, Norris um, Middle School, um, OPS Parish, and then we're just finishing up on Bryan Middle School. So before that, I didn't even have any of those opportunities to even be a part of, of those projects. Um, being a small business, it's really hard to get into um, big com companies working with general contractors because they really don't want to even have you even participate in any of those those jobs because they don't think that you're capable and have the manpower. So with you with um, OPS splitting up the contracts into smaller portions, that gave a lot of companies opportunities to work with you. And um, it, Jacobs has really been helpful with all of us. We um, they I was a participant in the Jacobs Construction Academy that you guys gave. There was quite a bit of contractors that went through this academy. Um, I think and I hope that they will continue to participate with you on this next bond. Um, this gives companies um, a really good um, teaching of some of the things they don't know. Um, so uh, I just think that that would be something to look into if you're going to you know, continue with them on the next um, bonding because they're very great on working with small businesses and making sure that things are done right with the general contractors with them. So thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Councilman Palermo. Palermo. My apologies. Hmm? Did I slaughter it, my friend? I apologize. You always do. It's okay. Good evening, everyone. Sorry. Uh, Vinny Palermo, V I N N Y P A L E R M O, 4520 South 41st Street. Mrs. Cassidy is my representative, Subdistrict 9. It's very easy for her. She has a. Uh, the best elementary school, Gomez Heritage, and the best high school, Omaha South High. Sorry, shameless plug. Yes. So uh, I was asked to come here tonight. I'm going to change it up a little bit. Uh, Superintendent Evans, President Snow, honorable members of the board, thanks for your time. Mr. Ray, is the clock going? Okay, I won't need five minutes. Um, 30 seconds? Perfect. And I know what Mr. Evans is saying right now. Vinny, now we've seen you more here at TAC off the school board than when we've seen you on the school board. And I know you want to say that, but you can't. So uh, I guess I'm just going to give you three different perspectives from uh, why I'm here to thank you for everything you've done. The first one was when I was uh, recently elected. We sat in your office. A uh, little short story. We uh, told each other stories back and forth. It was kind of a misty moment. Maybe it was hot and I don't know. Uh, but. Uh, it was, uh, it was one of those times where you, know, you, you get to know somebody a little better and you truly know that they care. And after that conversation with you, uh, I, I really got that out of that. And I knew from that point on, uh, us together, we're gonna move forward for all of the kids. So as a, a parent of an OPS kid, I wanna say thank you for caring. Because truly at the end of the day, that's half the battle, especially in your job. So uh, we move on a little bit further uh, from that great moment and uh, some may say uh, it was a little rocky but uh, I'll just say it was a little harder than it should have been uh, as we moved forward on the board and uh, well I can say this now maybe you can't but I can uh, people talk about a failed superintendent search uh, I never seen it that way to be honest with you I mean sure we didn't settle and in my eyes we ended up with the best possible outcome and that was for you to be here another year so as a past OPS school board member thank you for sticking around another year and uh, the third part probably the most important is uh, because you stayed around another year you gave your commitment to pass that second phase of the OPS school bond uh, for me four of those five schools will directly impact uh, the neighborhoods that I live in work and play in uh, for economic development, which is much needed and a better quality of life for all. So 
for you sticking through and, and holding to your word on getting that passed. I know there were some times when we thought, well, is it going to pass? But as we know, it passed pretty easily. So as a Omaha City Councilman, thank you for that. Uh, so I was kind of shipped out pretty early. I didn't get to thank, uh, get to thank a couple people that I uh, wanted to besides thanking you here tonight. Uh, Mr. Ray, this is when you don't want to hit that buzzer on me. There was a few people, um, and I called them 3M, kind of the tape, the glue company. And it was those people who kept us together during that time of uh, the up and down. And uh, we're not supposed to call anybody out, so I won't. But it was Matt, Monique, and Megan. They, uh, they were really there for all of us to hold us together through that time. And I want to publicly thank you guys for all you did. Uh, not to mention uh, everybody that's in the room over my left shoulder. Yeah, left shoulder, back at the table. Uh, these are the people that each and every day keep the, the wheels on the bus to keep uh, this monster that we have as OPS moving forward. And it's very important. So now that we're past that uh, kumbaya moment, uh, I, I do want to say something too that, because uh, I may not get a chance to ever be here again. And my friend that usually works security is not there, so I might get dragged out. But uh, on a serious note, we have an amazing superintendent coming forward. And the board's going to have some challenges. I mean, there's no doubt about it. We have challenges all throughout the city, and OPS is no different. So you're going to have to really buckle down. But with that being said, I want to remind you, uh, all you board members, that we have to take care of those frontline people, those seconds. people in the trenches. <clears throat> and uh, that would be the teachers. So even though you have to make the cuts, take care of those teachers, because they're taking care of those kids who are our future in the city. So. Uh, with that, thank you for all you do. Uh, your check's in the mail, just like every other board meeting. You know that. <laughs> Mr. Ray, I, I secretly always love that buzzer, so if you'd buzz me on the way out, that would be perfect. Okay, just Do I have to wait? You can't, like, hit the button? I'm sure you can fill it. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Evans, it was an honor. Thank you. My honor. Thank you, Councilman. Our next speaker uh, is Senator Vargas, Senator Tony Vargas. He's a matching uh, boot and socks. He always has the best socks. I know, right? <laughs> my name is Tony Vargas, T-O-N-Y-V-A-R-G-A-S. Uh, let's get my address, right? Okay. For security purposes, I choose not to share my... No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> um, 713... No, I know, I know, I know. Sorry. <laughs> 713 Caniglia Plaza, 68, Omaha, Nebraska, 68108. Uh, I don't know how to follow up Councilman Palermo. Um, I'm very fortunate to have Tracy Cassidy as my representative as well. Um, I, I want to thank Superintendent Evans. Um, it's, uh, it's been a privilege to serve as a, a colleague of yours and somebody both not only managing a superintendent, which is, as we all know, very, very difficult, but then managing the governance of this district is very difficult. And being in the Nebraska legislature now it, and, and seeing both the work that we do with OPS and having been on the board previously, I have a deep appreciation for the work that Superintendent Evans does. And for each of you, um, this is both uh, to congratulate him, but then also to sort of usher in this new direction uh, for a new superintendent to come in and for the board to continue their, their amazing, most very undervalued job of governance of this district. Uh, I'd like to mention that at, at many times, Superintendent Evans and I, we didn't always agree on different issues. But the one thing I could say that we always agreed upon was that we wanted to improve the district. Uh, it's a testament to the fact that there's not one solution to how we improve the district. If it was that easy, we would have figured it out by now. And so every single th good thing that's come out of this district has been because of the work and the conversations and the discussions and the compromise that's been made as a result of board members working with a superintendent and the superintendent being both willing to listen to those issues and pushing back when it's needed and then also taking a step back when we needed to reach some compromise. I've seen that. It's one of the reasons why now in the legislature I'm more willing than ever to then advocate on, on behalf of OPS because, again, uh, there's not one way to improve our district. There's not one sort of hero. but. I will tell you, having been in, in as a board member, seeing Superintendent Evans 
listen and then also take action and try to make every single change needed as part of our strategic plan and, and trying to use that benchmark and follow that roadmap is not easy. And uh, as somebody that works with many different perspectives and, and has been on this board, I just want to congratulate you on all the service you brought and recognize the efforts. And it's been a pleasure to both be outside of the legislature and see the work that you've done and also be alongside and sit next to you at times when superintendent, when Mark Snow wasn't there at times. Um, uh, so anyway, I want to congratulate you for all the work that you've done and for the incoming superintendent. Uh, I know that they are in good hands um, because I know that you know this. We won't always agree on every issue and that's okay. I do not always agree with every single legislator in my body. Uh, the way that we do really good governance comes as a result of the discussions that happen on this board. And um, I'm just fortunate enough to, to have worked with some of you. And it's really great to see a lot of you come and step into that governance role. It gives me hope that uh, we'll continue to grow as a district. And uh, if you need more from us in the state legislature, which I know is going to happen, come and talk to me. You know where to find me. We and, have you on uh, speed up. What is it? We have you on speed. Dial. I know that's uh, <laughs> that's for sure. Uh, anyway, thank you so much for having for your your work and support, and uh, best of luck in all your endeavors and what you go to from here on in. Thank you, Senator. Thank, thank you. you so much. One of the clock. You got a minute. A minute. <laughs> Take care, everybody. Thank you, Senator Vargas. Uh, moving on to uh, board member comments. I guess I'll start off first. Um, well, um, as you know, uh, this is Mr. Evans' last official board meeting uh, sitting at this table. And I've had the pleasure of sitting at this table with you practically next to you for five years. Uh, three of those years, you would hand me candy before every board meeting. I don't know. We had a, we liked candy. Um, but one of the things that I have to say is as an individual getting on this board, being elected at the age of 25, I grew and for the last five years growing on this board uh, working with you I would have to say we didn't agree on everything however you've opened up my eyes uh, and I've grown as a board member and I wouldn't be sitting in this chair today if it wasn't for working with you and listening to you and understanding the intricate the small little pieces that go in to the district every single day the people that wake up every single day um, and really working with an amazing educator uh, like yourself. So I would say I don't consider you a mentor, but I consider you kind of like an uncle friend. Um, and it's one of those things that we can have frank conversations, and I admired that from you, um, and I will miss you. And one of the things that we said before is when you agreed to stick with this board during our most rocky moments, it was very significant. and. Uh, it helped not just the 53,000 kids of Omaha Public Schools, but the great city of Omaha. Um, and I think some people don't really recognize that. And passing not just one bond, but two bonds. I mean, you've helped our district for the next 20 plus years and deferred maintenance. Um, and that wouldn't be going on without you. So the schools in South Omaha, the schools in North Omaha, as well as Northwest Omaha, uh, our community thanks you. And just from the bottom of my heart, um, I will miss you so much. Uh, effectively you might not believe it but I will um, and I promise myself I won't cry because I get emotional so thank you so much Mark Evans I believe you. I believe you. <laughs> okay um, moving on to uh, Vice President America okay um, First off, um, Katie Underwood, our former board member, is sorry that she couldn't be here tonight. And so she did um, email me some things that she wanted to share. Um, thank you to Mark Evans for his years of service to OPS. It's incredible to think about how much has been accomplished in a really short period of time. People are always very quick to point out the challenges that a large urban district faces, but I truly feel that Mark is leaving OPS in a substantially better place than he found it. I think about things like increasing teacher salaries, school turnaround plans that have really been successful, two bonds passing, the reorganization of the central office org chart, and a new human growth and development curriculum to name just a handful of things that he can be proud of when he leaves OPS. 
I hope he and Stacy continue to stay involved in the community, but also leave time aside to relax and be with family. Farewell and thank you for your service, Katie Underwood. Um, for me, it, it has been a five-year adventure. Um, I was thinking back today on the fact that really when you think about it, you were hired by one board, signed a contract essentially with a different board, and then actually started working here under a completely different board. Um, and just I think that almost foreshadowed all of the changes and things that were going to come over the next five years. Um, Yes, so, sometimes tumultuous, sometimes very good. Yeah. Um, I was thinking back on our first phone conversation when I think you and Stacy were driving from Wichita to Omaha and I was sitting in a tire repair shop. <laughs> um, and just all, all the things that have happened in our district that, that weren't even on our horizon um, when it, you started five years ago. No one was talking about doing a, one, let alone two bond issues that were both over $400 million. Um, there were no rumblings about let's have a strategic plan, let's embark on these big questions of who are we, are we headed the right direction, where do we need to be going? And those are all things that we've started and we've gotten in the right direction um, under your guidance and leadership. I know I personally very much appreciate um, the time that you've taken to go out into the schools um, and meet with kids, be in classroom, surprise teachers like my mom on the first day of school, <laughs> uh, which was very unplanned that one year. Um, but just thank, thank you for all the passion and time and energy that you've invested into our students, into our teachers, into our district. And since Stacy is sitting out in the audience, thank you, Stacy, um, for letting Mark stay another year um, and not kicking him out and making him live in his office. We, we greatly appreciate it. Thank you. Mrs. Gotti. Well, it has been a five-year adventure, really, this month. And uh, so I just thank you for all the many things that we've been able to accomplish uh, as a district a significant number of things that, um, as we used to say, every time we peeled the onion, there was just more there. <laughs> we were always shocked at what we found. So uh, there are so many things from a procedural organizational uh, perspective that have been addressed that weren't, um, that you would have thought would have been addressed maybe before, but hadn't been addressed. And so I thank you for taking those things on um, and I know sometimes those things were a distraction when there was bigger work to get done, but yet they had an impact on kids and what was happening in buildings and, and you understood uh, the importance of getting those things addressed. So um, having been a board officer with you for three and a half years, we spent a lot of time walking through lots of issues. And so I just want to thank you for the time and effort you put in. And also on behalf of my constituents, I think someone um, recently called me and said, you know, we wouldn't have accomplished what we did on this second bond if it hadn't been for Mr. Evans' work. So please make sure you thank him for the work he did on getting the Y partnership. That was pretty critical from my community's perspective. And so I just want to thank you for the effort that you put into community partnerships and working so hard through all the different um, organizations that are within the community. I know sometimes it's a, a, a bit of maneuvering through all of them. And so uh, I thank you for taking the time to do that. I also just want to thank Stacy as well. You've always been a delight and you've welcomed us into your home at different times and um, just been very supportive. And I appreciate that even after you purchased your RV a year ago to let him stay and <laughs> put the RV into storage and uh, <laughs> and wait until today. So um, I know you're looking forward to enjoying yourselves and I hope you do and that you'll be able to spend time with family and thank you so much. All right, Mr. Scanlon. <clears throat> well, I will, uh, I guess, go next. Thanks for everything. Bye. No, no. <laughs> Um, I just, I, so much has happened in the last five years and so much of it had, um, kind of been overshadowed by some, 
uh, big ticket items that um, some of the more important things that we accomplished as a district did not get the uh, attention that it should. Um, you know, as it has been said, the strategic plan, we finally had one. Uh, we developed one and we are starting to execute it and we will continue to execute it. And I think that's uh, important, especially for the board to understand, you know, that's where we need to be. We need to set a strategic plan and we need to say, this is, these are our expectations, go um, execute them. And and I think that's a, that's a big kind of uh, uh, shift in ideology from previous to where boards would get too far into the weeds. I think we, we again, need to get back up to that uh, level of uh, at that strategic uh, plan altitude and say, hey, this is what we want to see. You guys go execute it. And I think you've done a very good job of um, moving the administration in that direction. Um, the two bonds, uh, they are a huge equalizer. I mean, we were falling behind as a school district um, you know, we had window units, we had um, a lack of technology. Uh, we had a lot of reasons that um, parents should move their kids out of our district and take them into neighboring districts because we were not providing the facilities and the technology um, that is needed in order to compete for those children uh, in today's day and age. And I thank you for moving our district in that direction and also um, the two bonds, uh, it showed that it was long overdue when you have two-thirds of the voting saying, hey, yeah, we we need these, and both of them are, what, $400 million plus, so that's that's huge. Um, and I, and I, it's difficult to try to label which ones are the most uh, important and everything. Um, but uh, accountability for all schools. I mean, you had schools in our district that you were fine with uh, as a parent because they had um, outstanding principals. They had high achieving teachers. Um, it was just, it was like what, there is no problem in OPS. My kid's doing great. Um, but there were other schools that were not achieving the results that they needed to. And you brought in that accountability. The uh, educational directors, um, they allowed that um, oversight and that I think is it's it's up there in the the top one two three uh, um, things that were changed that that brought us to really achieve that every student every day prepared for success um, and also then taking and owning our persistently low achieving schools and saying hey you know what we know we're not doing what we need to with these schools in these areas. We're not going to continue to say, well, you know, it's it's excuse X, Y, or Z. We're going to go and we're going to give the resources that we need. And I think that those um, schools and those families, um, they needed the attention and they deserved the attention that they got. Uh, and then I will end with probably the number one that should have been, and I will, um, you know, give a stand innovation. Thank you, Stacy. <laughs> you kept him here and allowed him to do his job. Thank you so much. <laughs> yes, and I, you know, being married to you is, just, I don't know where to rank that one either. <laughs> Thank you. Dr. Holman. Mr. Evans, so although I do not have or have not had as close of a working relationship with you as some of my colleagues due to tenure on the board. Um, I still would like to say thank you very much for everything that you've done for the staff and students um, of Omaha Public Schools. Um, we thank you for your leadership, your guidance, your support, and your total advocacy for everyone. Um, it's obvious that you've had a tremendous impact on our district through all the comments that have been made about you tonight, and um, we are very appreciative of, of your service to our district. And 
wish you a very happy, blessed journey in your next life. Welcome. Mr. Smith. I also want to echo a lot of the comments that have been made. Thank you for your hard work and dedication. Um, it's totally different when you're in the trenches. I wasn't in the boat six months ago. Now I'm in the boat, and I know what it's like to get in there and paddle. Um, so it's been evident. You've always been re really um, easy to talk to and accessible, and that means a whole lot to our community, just being able to have that support. Um, you supported the African American Achievement Council. We've been able to meet with you regularly, and we um, appreciate the guidance and the direction that you provided for us. We've been able to be really active, and it makes an impact on all of our students. Um, I also want to say that I appreciate you for what you've done for our students. Um, being there in the buildings, not just providing the guidance for the teachers and the educators, but being a role model and mentor for those kids. Um, telling the story about wearing those jeans and when they were holy and tearing up your tough skins and all that kind of stuff. Our, our kids can relate to that. And so, yeah, I, rem I remember that story. Um, your leadership has also helped us to grow um, as a board, and so I look forward to continuing the work that you've laid out for us. I think we, uh, you've put together a good team, and um, we owe that to you to do a good job and deliver on a lot of the things that you've already made happen with the promises that you kept to us. So thank you very much. Mrs. Cassidy. Okay, well, Mr. Evans. So I've been on this board. I thought about this today driving here. I think my first meeting was like the end of June, early July, so I've been here about a year. And, you know, that councilman back there, is he still back there? Oftentimes when I, uh, yeah, Mr. Palermo, I'm looking at you. <laughs> Oftentimes when uh, I took over Mr. Palermo's seat, I thought, this, I, I'm not sure if I can do this. I'm not sure if I can handle this. This is, this is a lot. But I will say that you're, um, you made me feel welcomed right away and you helped me to ease into this position and you told me to find balance <laughs> which is sometimes difficult to do but you reminded me to just try to find balance and um, the rest would fall into place if I just keep in mind why I decided to you know take place or take part in this board so I do thank you for that um, I will say um, I kind of echo what everyone else has said I, I believe in fate and I believe everything happens for a reason and the fact that we had a failed superintendent search, which I do agree with Mr. Palermo, was not failed. Um, that happened for a reason. It led us to this place that we're at now. It led us to all the good things that you've been able to accomplish, specifically phase two bond, which is so tremendous for our entire district, especially my area. You know, the overcrowding is, that's part of the reason I've said before that I wanted to be a part of the change and making good things happen was seeing the, the overcrowding in my own area and I'm, I'm pleased to, to be a part of, of the change that's coming. That will be in place for years to come. So we thank you for that. Um, but you know, that, that failed search, so as everyone's put it, um, it led us to where we're at today though and it led us to um, a new era with Dr. Logan. So it happens for a reason, everything. So again, I'd, I'd like to echo everyone and just thank you for your service and enjoy retirement. Stacy will I'm sure she's going to put away all the cocktail dresses that she has. We talked about that at some of the last events that we've been at. Um, and just, you know, get in your grubbies and be in that RV. <laughs> Have a great time. Enjoy retirement. Thank you. Ms. Ryan. Um, I also want to extend my gratitude and um, congratulations to you for this next phase in your life. And I know you're going to be busy still, <laughs> but hopefully it'll be fun and relaxing and enjoyable. And I also do want to just thank you for, I've only been on the board for a year and a half, uh, so for always being willing to listen to me, whether it's uh, at the board table or in committee meetings and always encouraging me and um, just really showing that support. So thank you. Thank you. Moving on to School Spotlight with Ms. Monique Farmer. Can I make a one comment? Can I you can make a comment at the end. At the end, when we're all done. All right. Thank you. Can you hear me? This, this mic, okay, now it sounds like it's on. So good evening, Board President Snow, members of the board, and Superintendent Evans. I'm pleased to present our OPS Proud Spotlight. This evening is on the same person it's been on all evening, Mr. Mark Evans, Superintendent Mark Evans. It is your last Board of Education meeting, and we wanted to 
thank you with a video that represents your hard work and dedication to OPS students, teachers, staff, and the community. I'm going to echo some of the things that you all have already said this evening, but um, they're a good lead in to what you're about to watch. So during your five and a half year tenure, uh, the district implemented a strategic plan. You led the passing of two construction and renovation bonds for our community and our school district, nearly a billion dollars in work, both approved by voters two to one. You helped update our human growth and curriculum, human growth and development curriculum. You've increased our academic achievement and helped close the achievement gap among our student subgroups. The lighthearted phrases and advice that you've shared will forever remain in our hearts. No one can describe your optimistic personality and passion for students, teachers, and staff better than those of us who have had the opportunity to work very closely with you. So without further ado, OPS video journalist Alexander Hassel, thank you for putting together this video. Uh, it captures the impact that you've truly made on all of us. Let's take a look. Well, while we are working on this, um, Is it ready? Yeah, we can come back to it. Okay, we're still working we'll on it. Come back to it. We'll okay, so while we're working on this um, video, uh, it, it did work earlier, so we did test run this. Um, but <clears throat> as a board, a small token of our appreciation, um, we do have a. You want to grab the other thing too? Um, it's. We do have a small card uh, for the soup of OPS. And we have a plaque uh, from the board. Um, and there you go, and if you could read that plaque. And, uh, what's your In appreciation of your five years of service as superintendent of Omaha Public Schools and your 37 years of dedicated service, devotion, and commitment to public education. Thank you so much, Mr. Evans, uh, for everything you've done for us. Um, this is just a very small token of our appreciation to you uh, for all your dedication and work and service, not just to Omaha Public Schools, but to your 37 years as an educator, a life educator, as well as to your wife, um, because we do know jobs and careers like this, it's a team, uh, and I know you couldn't do, have done it alone. So thank you guys so much. Um, Do a photo of the whole board. One last good photo. It wasn't.
cutting your hair with OPS. Okay, this is maybe you could just put the mic right in front of me. Now it's working. Okay. Oh, yeah, thank you for being part of this mission. I don't use this All right. Yeah, we're still staring, I guess. We're going to need you to squeeze in a little bit more. Terrible. Okay. On this edge, just a little bit so we can get you all in. Okay. And probably maybe on the count of three, let's say something fun. Let's say happy retirement. Happy retirement. Let me just show this one more time. No Jayhawk. <laughs> You good? Mm -hmm. I think we're good. Do you want to? Let's do another one, two, three. Go Jayhawks. On three. One, two, three. Go Jayhawks. Jayhawks. <laughs> All right, we're going to do it this way. We're improvising. <laughs> And uh, it's the video. We're gonna try it. Now we, there is a video for you as well. Hey everyone, Chloe here with an OPS News Flash. We'd like to congratulate Mr. Mark Evans for being selected as the new superintendent for Omaha Public Schools. The Board of Education officially chose Evans for the position Monday night. It turns out he's a Jayhawks fan, but oh well, we'll try not to hold that against him. We look forward to having him here with OPS. This is Chloe. Have a great day. I want to thank you for being a part of this mission. I know you've accepted an opportunity to lead in this district to make a difference, to align, create a focus on where we're headed with 50,000 young people. By accepting this mission, you put an enormous amount of responsibility on yourself. Omaha Public Schools presents the Superintendent Mark Evans Retirement Extravaganza. Starring Mark Evans. I met Mr. Evans when he was doing the interview process. I had the pleasure of driving him around. And uh, one of the first things he got into my car when I was driving him around for his interviews, and he drops his stuff off in the back of my car, and he sits in the passenger seat, and he looks around, and he says, is this a Corolla? And I said, well, yeah, it's a Corolla. And he says, gosh, they really make nice Corollas. And he proceeded to make fun of my car for uh, several minutes as I'm driving him around. So I drop him off, you know, wait for a while, pick him up, and uh, he gets back in the car after one of his stages, and he goes, boy, is this a newer Corolla? So he proceeds to make fun of uh, my car for my first experience with him and my first thought was who's this jackalope and we can't possibly hire him and, and it uh, soon we we sure did and it, it was four years of making fun of my car or maybe five you know one that he says all the time whatever he's mean somebody hi you know how are you my name is mark evans and he always introduces himself as mark evans hi i'm mark evans the superintendent of schools the superintendent mark evans here at omaha public schools and even though he might know you he may answer the phone and say hi i'm mark evans superintendent of schools here at omaha i'm mark evans uh, superintendent of ops i don't know if you know me but i'm mark evans superintendent of schools hi i'm mark evans superintendent of omaha public schools and uh i'll say yes you called me for the millionth time hi i'm mark evans the superintendent of schools here in omaha i'm mark evans superintendent of omaha public schools he's had several markisms uh they're kind of little sayings that he says uh, to everyone well, every time i i say hey how you doing mr evans He's like, not better than you, my friend, not better than you, my friend. He does that every day, I think. I'm not as good as you. <laughs> says, how are you? Says, not as good as you. How are you doing? It's always, it's better than you, and you got the world by the tail. Not as good as you. If I were any better, I'd be you? No. Good morning, Eddie. Good morning. How are you? Not as good as you. How's it going? Hey, it's going good, but not as good as you. Oh, you've got the world by 
the tail or something. I don't even know what that means. Not as good as you. I'm not doing as good as you. We're not as good as you. Not as good as you. Yeah. <laughs> I still can't come back to any sort of rational response to that. When people ask me how I'm doing, the first thing that pops in my head is not as good as you, my friend. And so I have to stop myself from saying it because I'm not from Wichita. I think that's a Wichita thing. Uh, he'll say it to, you know, the, the governor of Nebraska, or he'd say it to, you know, a uh, uh, custodian at a school, so a uh, school bus driver, anybody, a parent. And so uh, it's those are just sayings that he says all the time. And uh, not that you get sick of them, but you can, they, they get memorized up here. He's got so, so many little, as he, he calls them, He's leaving little pearls for us that later on when he's gone, we will think that. So he, he likes to drop one or two pearls every, every time you're in a room with him. He constantly reminds us to be, um, be hard on the problem, soft on the people. If it didn't happen in the classroom, it didn't happen, make things better today than they were yesterday. Evolution, not revolution. Weedies aren't the breakfast of champions feedback here. Students first, being soft on people and going hard on problems. And there's nothing wrong with having a strong ego. Just do not have a big ego. I just love it when he says, it's good to have helpers. I'm just lucky like that. He gave an example of when he was a principal, and he, he used the phrase, I was madder than a cat on a hot tin roof. Wow. I don't know what that looks like to this day, but I'm pretty sure it's pretty mad and it's pretty hot. Um, so I'm still trying to figure it out. So if he could share that with me before he goes, uh, that would be a helpful pearl to me. Can't put baby in a corner. What is um, where I really appreciate it is, if he may not know this, is that he says those phrases and terms. But as you go and you do your work, you begin to actually internalize and think about those phrases and and turn them into actual practice. And so they've actually those phrases have actually um, helped me grow as a professional and as a person. But I don't know if this is Wichita or if it's Kansas or if it's just Mark. And uh, I would bet if I go there and I'm using these to fit in, I may find myself being stared at. Uh, an old friend of his described the way he, he talks and presents sometimes when he's out in public or in front of large groups as uh, uh, a hayseed uh, kind of personality, uh, hiding the fact that he is actually pretty darn smart. You may have heard, there now is another new leader coming from Kansas. And now that means that you're going to have to talk more slowly. Because as you know, Kansas folks aren't like Nebraska folks. So, talk to them, try to bring them along. Because it will take a little while for them to catch up. Superstar, just what I'm talking about. Superstar. Oh, no. Oh, my goodness. There you go. There you go. Wow. And I will get more emails as the weather starts to get closer to snow. And somebody said, well, it's mostly students out there. And actually, it's mostly teachers. I'm just, I'm just saying. I'm just saying, so anyways, that's my goal in my last year is more snow days, so I told several teachers that, boy, they were happy. He gets away with a lot with his playing, so he, all you have to do is, doggone it, and then he could say whatever after that and get away with it, and then you walk away going, wow, and then go, wait a minute, he just took a stab at me. He's a, he's a child sometimes trapped in a grown man's body, I remember being at one specific meeting with him and it was a meeting it was a lunch meeting and he was kind of sitting there drawing a picture on his napkin uh, as I was sitting next to him and it was uh, the image of this person's mustache that was in the room and so um, it was just kind of you know to keep things light and fun and sometimes not always serious it's sometimes stuff that you, you need to do to, to keep going I think in a, in a role like this. Mr. Evans is not just some yokel from down in Kansas with a southern drawl, but actually he has many layers, and I know I'm coming to you today as a representative to talk to you about one of the layers. He is actually the uh, a Jedi Knight of administrative interior decorating. I learned this through our uh, discussions in our restrooms during our renovation when I found that he was particularly enamored with the color pink. Oh, we're pretty excited. Well, I am going to miss this pink tile because it's pretty flashy. I think it was really riding style back in the, what, the 60s and 50s maybe? Uh, so we'll miss that. 
And so we just wanted to make sure we let Mr. Evans know as a tribute to his uh, internal design uh, expertise that we're going to change the beverage colors to pink and all the all the gold panels on the outside of the uh, building will be changed to pink just for him in tribute to his five years here as an administrator and interior decorating expert. He frequently comes into HR and asks where a margarita machine is. I'm not sure if he ever plans on finding one, but he does seem to ask that almost every week of us. The other thing is he'll walk by, and even though he's seen me that day, he'll walk by and ask Lindsay, is Matt working today? That's my Mark Evans impersonation. Is Matt working today? Um, and uh, even though he's already seen me, but is Matt working today? Is he asleep in there? Oh, it's so irritating. There you go. Oh, you don't like to? Okay, all right, you don't have to. You don't have to, it's just an option. A plus star, because you, my friend, have done good things, and I want you to keep up the good work, okay? Is that all right? All right. Keep up the good work, my friend. Keep up the good work, my friend. Keep up the good work, my friend. You know who else? Who, you know who else gets a fist bump? Miss you. Miss you. Superstar. He always makes people feel like he's interested. And I think he genuinely is. It's very easy to talk to, very easy to approach. I think just the familiarity and the, the ease of having a conversation with him. Um, he is the same person in front of um, 100 principals as he is one-on-one. -on -one. I'm talking to May. We're just going on and on about the great job. And I wanted you to know they were bragging you up pretty big. That's good to hear. Thank you. Yeah, they said you were awesome and that you were one of the finest second-year teachers that I've ever seen. My age helps, I think. <laughs> the experience, the maturity. <laughs> oh, I just know they're bragging and saying that you're making an incredible difference, and I just want to thank you for that. I feel like I could go in and talk to him at any time if I had a concern or a question. He was always available. Alongside being personable, um, he really takes a vested interest in your personal growth. Easy access, and you know, if we needed to call him, uh, he was there. If he wasn't, he would return your call. It's because it's, it's a people business. And he's always been good with people. He's always available um, to sit down and talk to. Um, if you have a really big problem, it's amazing how he can walk you through the steps and just understand all of the different angles and all these um, different insights. And you can walk in with a really tough problem and walk out with a really easy, simple solution. He's very open. He's very genuine. Um, he's he, he's real. He, he, he doesn't... Uh, try to package things in the way that people think they should be packaged. I appreciate the different things that I've been able to take away from his leadership. Mr. Evans always focuses on the relationships and uh, it's kind of nice to have that down-to-earth approach to things. I think Mr. Evans is pretty awesome. Another thing also that is admirable to me is to watch him correct misinformation, to watch him stand up for the mission of this district and our purpose that he's here for kids and that he's he really has support he's supportive of all of us he really trusts that you know that you have the autonomy to do your work um, run your school that you have the best interest of the kids i've really enjoyed watching him work and all the things he's done and, and i feel privileged to have that opportunity to work for him we thank him for pushing forward and, and getting that bond passed one of my most memorable moments of you will be the time you decided to dance publicly at our conclusion of our first Summer Principals Institute. I must say, this following video shares it all. My advice to you is, Never to dance publicly. I'm not quite sure if it was start the mower, water the lawn. I kind of gave it the I'm trying to slide an airplane. You have no rhythm. You have a lot of other skills, but never, ever, ever dance publicly in a video again.
so this is beloved. We're down here to dance. We want to have a dance off. That's my thing with Mr. Evans. Is we we started the year with a good dance off, and I am ready to finish that dance anytime you want to, man. I got the groove, I got the mood, I got the steps, and I am willing to get down with you again. It's your floor, Mr. Evans. Wow. Uh, <laughs> I am humbled and a bit embarrassed. Uh, I actually didn't think those dance moves were that bad. And <laughs> if that floor was a bit slippery, I can actually moonwalk, but it, you, you couldn't tell on that floor. So, Mr. Lee, I mean, our, our time's not over yet, so there still may be another challenge. Uh, but, but in all honesty, uh, thank you to the board, thank you to the community, thank you to all the staff. I mean, this has been uh, an incredible five-year journey, and um, it, to me, I'm a pretty ordinary guy with an extraordinary passion for kids, and that, that's about it. That's about it, and at the end of the day, that's what matters. Uh, leaders really don't choose to be leaders. They choose to make a difference, and if you choose to make a difference and make that your, your mission, it kind of comes by itself. You didn't really have to purposely go out after it. You just knew, I want to make a difference. And so for 37 years, I've always wanted to make a difference and always be able to say, well, I got a few sayings. You heard, you, you heard some of them. Actually, I've got quite a bit more than that, too. But I won't go into all those pearls. But, but I always do uh, look back and I always say to folks, I don't care if you're a teacher, a principal, bus driver, school board member, it doesn't matter. Is it better today because you were here? And will it be better tomorrow? And if it is, what's your evidence? What's your artifact? What do you say is different in your classroom, on your bus, in your school, in your school district? What have you done that helped move the work forward to make a difference for kids? And, and at the end of the day, if that happens, nothing else really matters. And so I, I feel confident with the partnership at the board table and all the great folks I've had the opportunity to get to know and, and work with, uh, some for a lengthier period than other board members, but uh, it's been an honor and a privilege. And uh, thank you, Councilman Palermo and Senator Vargas, for your kind words as well. And thank you for your support. We need that kind of support in the council and in the legislature too. So that's, that's our critical piece to have OPS friends all over. We need friends all over. And, and by the way, we got quite a few when 67% of them say, I'll vote to raise my taxes to help you build beautiful schools for your wonderful children and your wonderful staff. So it's been a great, great journey, an awesome journey, and uh, I appreciate everybody. So thank you so much. Thank you. I better call back. Before I, I'm going to call back. I didn't appreciate the person I'm supposed to appreciate more, most and do, my lovely bride of 36 years, Stacy. Thank you so much for tolerating me for 36 years in the last five years here because there were moments it's probably you're probably wondering, oh, you don't know about this. You know, this fellow's not ever home. But you may regret me being home more at the end of the day. That's what I'm thinking. You may regret that. But I suspect with a, our granddaughter and other, other distractions, maybe you can get away from me enough that you, you'll, you'll be able to tolerate seeing me a little bit more. But thank you, dear, for, for your support, not only in Omaha for five years, but for 36 years in all the different jobs I've had from principal and other district levels. So thank you for that, dear. Thank you. Well, like anything, thank you so much for everything you've done for us, Mark Evans, and your hard work. Um, but you are still on the clock until the end of the month. So we're going to put you to work tonight uh, for tonight's board meeting. Um, so I'm going to log in to my agenda. I believe we're on the consent agenda. I will now entertain a motion to approve the consent agenda that is before us.
So moved. Second. We have a motion by Ms. America, second by Dr. Holman. Any abstention? Roll call, please. America? Aye. Perlman? Aye. Ryan? Aye. Scanlon? Aye. Smith? Aye. Snow? Aye. Cassidy? Aye. Godding? Aye. Holman? Aye. Nine aye. All right. Moving on. To motion carries. Moving on to J1A, Phase 2 Bond Program Management Services. And I'll give whoever. I think we have uh, the evaluation team coming to the podium. Uh, I believe, uh, yeah, I see the. A couple of our principals, as well as some district staff that are part of the evaluation team. Good evening, President Snow, Superintendent Evans, and fellow board members. <laughs> I didn't realize that video was going to be shown tonight. <laughs> so now I'm going to try and get serious. <laughs> so uh, this is the uh, committee that gathered to review the proposals uh, that were presented and, and uh, brought in uh, to submission uh, Jeremy Matson, Tammy Yarman, uh, Betsy Cush, Carlos Cozarts, and uh, Kara Saldanero, uh, who is absent tonight, was also part of the committee. And uh, so we feel like we ran a fair and equitable uh, process. Uh, we started by all of us getting submitted for the four proposals that were presented. Uh, we went through those uh, individually, separately. Uh, we uh, put our own scoring to those proposals, and then we returned those the following morning uh, back to uh, business services uh, where the scores were tallied. And I believe you've seen those scores, and I think you see the, the difference in the, uh, those scores. Uh, at that time, then, they brought in two uh, companies to interview and we uh, each listen to a one-hour presentation uh, from each of those companies and then there was a 30-minute question and answer where we each ask questions uh, after all was said and done uh, we feel very good about our recommendation and that recommendation to continue on with phase two of the bond would be uh, led by Jacobs. Jacobs is an excellent uh, company. I just want to submit some, uh, some things that the committee uh, agreed upon as we were talking. One, they were student-centered, and that's what this is all about. The work that's being done is for the students, and we felt that they were very student-centered. We felt that they were team-oriented. They had the ability to communicate and to communicate with all stakeholders, and not only the ability to communicate, but to collaborate with everybody. And we feel very good about the fact that they were reflective on some of the things that they might have considered, uh, considered their shortcomings in phase one with the uh, intentions of improving those things in phase two. And so we feel they're going from phase one to phase two and keeping uh, continuity and not having to go through another learning curve that Jacobs uh, came out on top and you can see that uh, not only with the proposal reviews but also with the interviews how the scoring came out and so this committee at this time would like to recommend Jacobs to, over to be the oversight for phase two of the bond. Thank you. Um, We'll now open up for any questions, comments, concerns from members of the board. Dr. Holman. Thank you. Um, because I was not on the board um, at the time of the 2014 bond, can someone explain to me the process as far as like the time length for, that the bid was out for? Because um, I understand that this one was pretty short at seven days. What was done previously with the 2014 bond? So I'd have to double check, but I believe that the original 2014 bond was also on a fast track pace for selection, and I think it was a very similar time frame as this current phase two bond selection. I believe it was eight days. Eight 
Mr. Scanlon. I guess, and just for the public's knowledge, um, this wasn't, I, well, I'm asking, was this started prior to the bond passing, the selection of a um, um, bond oversight uh, company? Uh, the RFP, the request for proposals for the program management services, was issued after the passage of the bond on May 15th. As it was for the first phase? Correct. Okay. Oh, I'm sorry. Take, um, the first phase was actually for stakeholder engagement and community services and then had a program management part of it added to that original RFP for the 2014 bond. Okay. Um, so that was passed before the passage of the bond in part because of the work that was needed to develop the, the bond program that would go out to the voters. Okay. And that... I guess just for the public knowledge, uh, that was a part. Uh, we did go into a contract with Jacobs for the second phase uh, bond development program. I believe that was $75,000. But, but that was developed uh, in order to, again, uh, speed the, the process along and, and provide prepare some. the information to distribute to the, the voters for approval. Right, OK. Um, and I guess I find it. Very convenient that we have three people in this committee that uh, two are principals, one at a high school that had renovations, one at a junior high, or not a junior high, elementary that had renovations done, and then also uh, economic emerging, uh, emerging businesses. Could you guys speak to the um, process of how Jacobs uh, performed in your first phase when your schools and the economic inclusion plan was developed, please? I'd love to speak to that because Jacobs did a tremendous job for us. Uh, we, we had some challenges uh, with the uh, architect. We had some challenges with the architect switching in the middle of the, uh, of the process. And yet Jacobs uh, went above and beyond and stepped in and took on some roles that they did not have to. I will also tell you that during weekly meetings uh, that eventually went to bi-weekly, but whenever the program manager was unable to attend, which was very seldom, but when he wasn't able to attend, they had someone there in his place representing so that the communication continued. Uh, I have nothing but positive things to say about Jacobs. And I will tell you, though, when I went through the proposals uh, that I kept an open mind about every, everything. Uh, but when it, even when they came back for the interview, um, just the things that they were sharing and saying, I can sit there and nod and say, yeah, they're right. I, I experienced that that is true. I also believe they reached out to small emerging businesses to be involved in the program. Uh, and I had the opportunity to talk with some of those contractors when they came into the building who were very excited and pleased to have those opportunities. I believe when I read the proposal that uh, the economic inclusion was, uh, the goal was 7%. If I'm not mistaken, I believe they went above and beyond to 11.6% if I remember my numbers correctly, which means they went above and beyond. So I speak highly of Jacobs and the work that they did. Hi, I'm Betsy Kish, and I'm the very proud principal over at Johnson Elementary School. Um, as Mr. Scanlon knows, he worked closely also with us um, as we went through our bond. I have nothing but positives to say. That wasn't always true. Um, I asked some very tough questions, just so the board knows, um, and spoke up in the interviews, because the process did not start as we kind of anticipated it would. Um, and But the part that turned me was um, Jacobs stepped in. And um, our, prog prog our uh, PM, our uh, project manager, wasn't a fit for our school, for our community. Um, weren't, things weren't rolling. We were an open school. We had an open concept. Um, and we, were, we had big visions of doors and walls and keys and, um, and all of those things that were rooted th with us. Um, we had big uh, a community support going into Burke, um, going into our community, and then coming back to Joslyn. Um, and safety is the number one concern. And so we wanted someone that was reflective of that and with that history. And so um, they stepped in, Mark Summers, Mr. Scanlon, um, Mr. Evans came in and they brought on Wiley Osborne and um, he saw our vision. He met with the kids. He met with the community. They were there on field day. They did lots of different things and projects with our school. Um, we did the, uh, the engineering program and from that day things turned around. And, um, and so the, when they spent a lot of time talking to us about you know, um, from going through, from being a part of it, um, with a new uh, project or with a, a new firm, 
you know, one of the things I reflected on is you don't know what mistakes they're going to make. And you don't know that growth that's going to happen because it hasn't happened. But someone that you've been with and all the schools that you can attest to, principals you can talk to, community members, all the way down to any student, specific, specifically even at my school. Um, and then, so you know, and you know that they can be reflective on those things. And that was a big piece of um, the questioning I asked. Um, because I'm just very proud and over the moon to say, please come visit us. We have doors and walls and locks and keys. And um, we're very safe, but also our kids have a great learning environment um, for our parents, our families. Our building now is one that can be used um, 24 hours a day if it could be. Um, if we could have got two gyms and I'm still working on getting a scoreboard from um, my field out back and there's some things that I'm going to keep working on um, because it's just now it's um, in that part of the city it's it's a hub for us to do lots of things. Um, Jacobs made that happen um, and they were there to guide us and guide our families um, in directions, guide our staff and, um, and, and you know to say no to things that, that weren't a part of the district vision as well and here's why and then to guide us in where we needed to go for our students to be successful every day thank you good evening board my name is Carlos Cozart I'm the project director for economic inclusion and I know that numbers is not everything I would say that uh, when the board uh, passed the uh, approved the bond program and passed phase one they established initial goal of uh, seven percent for inclusion for small and emerging businesses so when I say that numbers is not everything though the initial goal was for seven percent the goal today or the uh, benchmark that has been established today exceeds eleven percent what that equates to the goal of seven percent would have equated to about twenty two million dollars to date over forty one million dollars have been has been committed to tier one and tier two small emerging businesses. You've heard the impact of those opportunities provided to small emerging businesses earlier during the course of our public uh, comments by some of the participants in the economic inclusion program. And not only has it impacted the small uh, emerging businesses that, have, uh, that are immense in the communities that we serve, but likewise, it also impacts on the students that uh, attend OPS through the various STEM related pro projects and programs that are part of economic inclusion. So I would say that the economic inclusion program and what Jacobs has done as a part of making sure that that program is inside the community and that the uh, uh, small emerging businesses that reside in those communities or integrated into the program has been been outstanding. I mean if again if numbers mean anything it's $41 million more outside, in, inside those communities than it was in 2014. I just want to thank you guys for that, um, for those comments. And um, having been a member of the CBOC committee, um, I truly think that uh, Jacobs um, took on a lot of scrutiny early on. Uh, from a lot of community members and they were able to stand up to that scrutiny and provide answers that satisfied um, quite a few people that are um, you know experienced in um, construction whether it's uh, building legally finance um, so so I, I do believe that uh, Jacobs has done a very solid job on this first phase and I think that um, you know, I would say that moving on to the second phase, we would benefit um, from having the same project manager or the same bond manager go into the second phase because they have that knowledge base um, from that first phase. And with that being said, I'm not going to discourage our legal from, uh, you know, reducing their fees as much as possible to save the taxpayer dollars, but uh, I would say that uh, I think it has been a very successful first phase, and I think that uh, sticking with that same program, that bond manager uh, would uh, benefit the district. Mrs. Godin. Well, I just also wanted to ask Mr. Lee, uh, did your school just get recognized as well for a design? 
Yeah, they did. Can you share yeah, that with yeah, us, that's just publicly? Right <laughs> uh, yes, uh, KAI actually was uh, recognized for the design, uh, and it was a nationwide. Uh, I believe it was sent to uh, Monique. She might know more about it than I right. do, uh, but yes, we did. And and I and I guess that just speaks to even though it started as a challenge, and I was part of the um, committee on selecting the. You know, general manager for the mm -hmm. project, um, but even though it started as a challenge, you still ended up getting national recognition for Absolutely. design. And I know you were very involved, and you did a great job of uh, tweaking things as well as the principal of the building, which is imp important. But um, I just think back to when we were first looking at phase one and trying to select a bond manager. Uh, I spent quite a bit of time going out to websites of other districts around the country who which had done bond projects and taking a look at their websites, taking a look at the information that was presented to the public that they had. And I think I can truly say since 2014, anytime I want to look and see where we're at, I can do that through our website and I find it more uh, maneuverable. The, the website that Jacobs has put together for us. I also uh, truly believe like Matt said, that you know they worked through the economic inclusion piece in an amazing way, and I remember meeting with Galitha and Gabrielle. Yeah, Gabrielle. I can't believe I forgot her name. But anyway, they did such an amazing job, and I just really appreciated Jacobs bringing them in from Chicago. Two women who were so talented beyond anything that um, sorry, but I think this city seen before. And they brought the program here to us, and we have advanced economic inclusion within the city of Omaha because of the work that happened through Omaha Public Schools. So I have no doubt that if that work continues on, we'll continue to see economic development from our uh, partners that we've become new friends with that we didn't even know existed before. And I think that's the really exciting thing. And when I'm talking to constituents, it's one of the things that I'm very, very proud of from this, um, from our bond work, but also just how smoothly things have gone. And um, and I know we'll be well under budget on this first phase, and we'll be looking at those numbers soon. But um, I, I have no doubt that continuing on will just kind of keep us running at the pace that we've been running at since 2014. Miss Ryan. Um, I just have a few questions. Uh, with the first phase of the bond, were board members involved in this process of selecting the project man or the bond manager? In the first phase, mm -hmm. the selection for the 2014 bond. Mm -hmm. uh, if I remember correctly, Katie Underwood was on the selection process at that time. Okay. So, uh, what was the process of including the board in this selection round? Um, that I don't know. I'd have to defer to Dr. Turnquist. While she's coming up, I, I think it was just the board officers that were involved in conversations. I don't know if Dr. Turnquist had something separate from that. Well, I, I do know that some board members had been asked if they would be willing to sit on a committee for this. And uh, I think because the process had moved rather quickly, which I understand the urgency in wanting to make this decision, um, I think it was a failure on that, that that those two board members, I believe, did not get to be a part of that committee. Um, and then also speaking to the piece, sorry that I made you come up here and then That's just right. said that. Um, but uh, speaking to the piece about the scoring and the fee structures and everything, I didn't get those emails until um, in the afternoon. And I also work a full-time job and I have not been able to review those materials. Um, so I do not feel comfortable in um, making that decision when I haven't been able to look at all the documents. Well, with regard to your first question, I believe it was uh, a concern on the part of top administration that for board members to be part of the review committee was a conflict of interest because the board ultimately votes on the recommendation from staff. And the RFP document did specifically state that staff would review all of the uh, documents uh, and do the interviews. Um, 
as far as the timing is concerned, I can, just to give you a, a brief glimpse of it, there was a significant difference in scoring both on the proposals and on the interviews between Jacobs and the second place team, and then a continuing di a significant difference between the second place proposal and the rest. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Mr. Perlman. Um, I just have a couple quick questions. My first is, do we know what the anticipated percentage of the uh, first phase bond will be spent on project management? I, I know it's probably not all been spent, but what the anticipated cost will be, um, just so I can kind of have a frame of reference for the projected cost for managing phase two. Offhand, I don't know what that uh, amount is for program management for the 2014 bond, but I can follow up with Mr. Ray and get that number to distribute to all board members. Okay. Uh, yeah, and I don't know it off the top of my head, but I believe it's 3.4%. Does that sound right, Jeremy? Uh, it's under 4% total, but that does sound pretty close. So pretty much the same as what's projected for phase two. Um, my second question is the, the fee estimate is within two-tenths of one percentage there's a range and it's within two tenths of one percent of each other but is there a and I, I wouldn't expect the fees to spiral out of control but is there a maximum and I know they are to be negotiated but can you just explain to us what that would look like and again like I said this is all just yeah just cross all the contract terms dollars. are to, to be negotiated right. but it would all be kind of set on the overall bond value amount so it'd be that percentage towards that bond value and if there's any added services we request of them there could be additional fees but that's all something that would have to be presented to and approved by district operational services and the board as a change to the contract so in other words uh, that decision on fees will be made before work begins is that accurate i would assume that, that or would, within a near time frame. correct either that or some yeah um there would have to be some type of a uh, letter of understanding or memorandum of understanding before service would have to begin that we'd have to have legal counsel input on but ultimately um before anything would get started we'd have to have some form of agreement okay to, and again I, I don't it. expect it to be yeah right to protect taxpayers I, you yeah. know no one wants it to go to five or six but again not expecting that at all yeah. just so very sure. similar to the start of the 2014 bond while we're working through the contract terms there is a memorandum of understanding letter of understanding something that says we'll agree to these services for these scope of work until we can finalize it in agreement okay thanks miss america um so first i want to thank you all um and kara for taking the time to review um the proposals that we received and to do the scoring and do the interview process because i know that does take a lot of time um with us reading through the superintendent search firm proposals over the last couple of years. Um, and I, I, I'm trying to figure out a word that's best. I know as a board officer, I was not involved in this. I don't no, want there to be an understanding that the board officers had a part in reviewing the firms at all, no, because we didn't. No. Um, and I don't think that's what you meant, but just in case anybody took it that way. Um, I just wanted to say I agree with what Dr. Turnquist said. If, as board members, we're voting on this, if we had participated in the review of it, that is a conflict, and we're board members. We don't do building construction, most of us. Um, we are not in the buildings working with the contractor. I wouldn't know how to score a proposal if you put one in front of me. I could be like, yeah, that sounds great. Okay, that doesn't sound as great, but we're almost relying on the input of the experts who do this to make that recommendation to us. I think it's similar to when curriculum and instruction says, hey, we've had our teachers review material, and this is one that they think works best for the classroom. I don't know what curriculum material works best in the classroom. I trust curriculum and instruction to let us know what that is. In this case, I trust the people who do construction and are working in our building to make that type of recommendation to us as well. Dr. Holman. Um, I just have a couple other questions. And again, please forgive my lack of knowledge as this is um, still kind of new to me. And I want to start off with the comment of conflict of interest. And 
Again, this is no disrespect to any of you. you know I love Northwest. I mean, it's a beautiful building. That's my building. I love it. Um, and I think that Jacobs has done a wonderful job with um, all the work and effort that they put into our buildings. But in regards to the conflict of interest, I understand that we have to vote, but how is it not a conflict of interest to have building principals on this committee when they love the work that Jacobs has done? Um, and obviously, I'm, I'm assuming that we would only have people on this committee that's going to speak highly of the job that has been done by Jacobs. So I guess I'm kind of confused with the conflict of interest and how it applies to us, but not necessarily them. Um, and then also, just kind of back to the RFP, I'm not even sure if I'm going to say this correctly, but um, how was the RFP, how was this advertised? What is the process of this being advertised? Um, where is it advertised for companies to view the information? And then what is a typical time frame if you're not doing like a fast track? What is a typical time frame for an RFP to go out on a job of this magnitude? To your first question about the conflict of interest, mm -hmm. I believe it's because the request for proposals stated staff would review and evaluate and that we're, the principals are staff members of the district. Um, the second part of that is the uh, request for proposal was advertised in the daily record just like all other project bids, architectural selection services, everything else is advertised. It was also posted on the district's website um, as well as many personal phone calls are made to known companies that provide those types of services. The time oh, um, as to the duration, it, it's really kind of difficult to tell because every district does it a little different, but I'd say on a typical request for proposal process, it might be anywhere from two weeks to four weeks. Um, just kind of depends on the time you have available in your schedule for the services and uh, the amount of um, time you basically have to give them to submit their proposals and review proposals. And I, I would like to add of the five, uh, companies that submitted RFPs, the vast majority came in from out of state. Mr. Pullman. Well, I just, just a couple quick comments. It's, I don't see it as a conflict of interest um, at all. There's just no conflict, and there has to be a conflict to be a conflict of interest. And, um, you know, we as board members sit on a lot of committees that um, our subcommittees, uh, like principal hiring committees, where we sit on those, and then later on the full board votes, or other actually other construction ones. I've, I've been on one where I've, I've helped score, and then the full board does. Um, I, you know, Miss America, your, your point is very valid, though. Should we? I mean, that's that's a very good point. I, I I had a tough time scoring those construction things. I you know that's not my line of work, um, but. And I don't, I mean, it doesn't matter if we get into semantics of it as a conflict or not. It's certainly not a conflict. It's whether or not we chose to um, say that in the RFP whether or not there was going to be a board member or not. Um, I think there was just some misunderstanding about that because there definitely was some board members who said that they were going to be. But uh, here we are. I trust, I trust this group. They know the buildings and, and, and the process as well. So I don't have any, I don't have a qualm with that. It's just a, 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 another miscommunication. So thanks. Okay. Um, Mr. Scanlon. I would have to say that, um, you know, just a couple of things. Um, Betsy is the principal of Joslin Elementary, and that's in my, uh, in my district. And she was not happy with Jacobs to begin with. And we went through a process and, um, you know, we talked with Jacobs and we got it uh, uh, resolved. And what she said earlier, she was very happy with the, the end result, but it was not a um, smooth process from the beginning, and there was, there was conflict. So if you want to say that we just threw some people or that people were thrown up on this committee um, that were just pro-Jacobs, uh, I would have to say that Betsy was not pro-Jacobs in the beginning, and she can, you know, yeah. And so we had some conversations. So, so I think that, th that what we have here is we have some people that, um, um, that they open-mindedly looked at what their experiences were. And also, um, I think that part of um, 
I don't know if Carlos was hired at that time, but um, you know, we had a board member or two that was calling for $400,000 to be uh, a part of the bond for economic inclusion, which uh, Jacobs at that time said, we will include that for no extra charge. So, um, you know, I don't want to say politics can sometimes come into play with this of where some people want money to go to, but uh, Jacobs, I think, did an outstanding job with economic inclusion um, as part of their package um, that uh, in, we've heard from a couple of different contractors tonight that I don't feel that that was uh, part of the 99 bond, but, uh, you know, I, I don't want politics to get in the way of, of uh, moving forward and selecting the best, most qualified uh, bond oversight uh, company. And um, again, just to reiterate to the public, uh, the um, what was presented on here, the um, phase two bond program management services, uh, Jacobs did state in their a proposal that they are open to negotiations. They had stated, I think, a 3.45 to 3.65 uh, percent um, fee, but they were open to negotiations, and that's why I encourage legal to uh, be aggressive with that and get the best deal for OPS. Um, so I, I, th I think that there's, um, you know, I, I, I don't want to see the politics ruin a good relationship that OPS has with Jacobs. Mr. Pullman. Well, I just just have a follow-up question to your comments. And you, you said Betsy, who I, I don't know at all, um, was not in favor of Jacobs initially. And then there were some conversations had about, about Jacobs. Can you shed some light on that? Yes, I can. Um, they had, or do you want Betsy to answer? I guess. OK. Betsy, do you want to answer that? Or I can answer it being a, Okay. You go ahead and I fill in. Okay. Uh, Betsy had given me a call and had said, you know, we had our initial meeting with our um, Jacobs team member and our architect, and uh, the first meeting did not go well. She felt that the um, educational spec team was not listened to as much as they should have been, and she was just, um, she's pretty much. Uh, defeated in the fact that, oh my gosh, they're going to tell me what I have to do, uh, what our school's going to get. And she gave me a call, and I called, uh, you know, Superintendent Evans. I talked to Jacobs. I said, we need to have a meeting. And that team came together, and team members were changed on that. And she alluded to that. And, right. um, and I think that we were able to have a successful project that was not starting off well. Okay. And no, it, I appreciate was, that. it was a positive ending. If you want to add to that, please do. Yep. And that was exactly. And I just felt like our vision, our mission, how we felt just going from that open concept with safety, um, you know, and so one of the things was, you know, how are project managers picked? How are they selected? You know, here we are trying to pair up you know, teachers and um, administrators, um, you know, with our students and, and our families hearing them. And so that that came down to, and that was one of the, one of my key things was, um, you know, looking at that now going forward, how are those, um, you know, because one thing they do look at is on paper, they look at, um, you know, the scope of the project, they look at the specs of the project, they look at the different things that are going to happen. But for me in my world, and I'm a big relationship person, I look at the people. So I want to know who's working with our kids, who's working with me, who's working with my staff. I had a huge Ed Specs committee that involved parents and community, and we wanted to know and we wanted to be heard. And so when we weren't, um, that's when, and, um, and I just can't tell you enough how fast that happened. Um, Mark Summers, I believe, came out that day. Um, and just how fast of a turnaround, they I really felt like they listened to us, listened to the school, turned our whole project around from going from this is what's going to happen to you instead of us being a part of the whole project. And then I, going forward, I've heard other projects that's that's happened where you're they're involved um, and everybody's being heard um, going forward. Great. I appreciate yeah. that. So yeah. out, out of you five, how many have had bond work in your buildings uh, managed by Jacobs? Just the two? We're the two. Perfect. Okay. And so, and you spoke to what you just spoke about initially, about mm -hmm. how you just had a great experience with Jacobs mm -hmm. the first time. Mm 
Hi, I'm Tammy with Nutrition Services, and I thought I would speak up because uh, I worked with Jacobs in all of the kitchens, whether it was ceiling replacement, uh, fire and safety, serving line replacement, kitchen remodels, or new kitchens. You know, we got a couple new schools that we're working on, Columbian and the 32nd Street uh, building over here. And, and I was here in the 99 bond, too. And I just want to mention that I enjoy working with Jacobs. They listen, you know, the ideas that come across may not always be what I kind of envision, but they listen to what we want. And they're always responsive and they follow up. And they ask questions and they've learned about kitchens, you know, being on the project because there's a lot that goes into play when you put equipment in and you've got people working. And so uh, when I reviewed the materials that we were presented, one of the things that I heard in the in the uh, open interviews when they presented was the fact they have a plan. <clears throat> they had a plan in place that I knew that once the board approved, they were ready to go. You know, they told us, here's what we're going to do, here's what we're going to change, we've got this in place, and we knew that it was going to start if we want to get a high school built. And if we want to get uh, the high school in South Omaha and the high school up in Northwest, we want to get it, but we need to get started. And they have a plan. And that came out so loud and clear that that was uh, big for me, as well as the fact that they were so student-centered. And, and I mentioned uh, to the committee was the fact that they involve students in construction, in accounting, in contract review, that our kids are going to learn from Jacobs about what it is if they're not if they're not into construction work and they're in accounting they're going to learn about budgets and so uh, those are a couple of items that really impressed um, me in the whole process so i may yes i didn't mean to cut you off oh again. that's okay um so heading into this process you already had a great feel for jacobs and, yes, and loved what they were doing yes i did even before you scored her scored uh, them i had a a great experience with them you know there were times in working with the different project managers you know we kind of saw things a little differently but I think a lot of it was the fact that they didn't know kitchens you know uh, kitchens are a little different with ovens and everything and once I laid out what the rationale is and what we look for and and uh, you know it came around and it's a very pleasurable experience uh, I really enjoyed working with them. And, and my final question is for all of you. Do you think you went in this blind, or did you already have a, a, an idea that you wanted Jacobs? I did not. You know, I, I took a look at each individual uh, uh, packet that was given to us. I looked at what was sent out for the bid, and I looked and compared each book to that. And then when we went into the interviews, I listened. You know, that's big is tell me what your plan is. You know, we don't want to, you know, uh, so many of the, you know, was, well, we'll develop or we'll meet. And, and, and the plan was there. And that's what I listened to. So I went into it with an open mind. Uh, this is the first time I've sat on a scoring committee like this. And so I went into it with an open mind. I went in with an open mind, and I compare it to this. So we're interviewing for a, a social studies teacher. And I had someone that I really wanted, and we interviewed. And guess what? Someone else came in and interviewed better. That person got the position. That's the way I look at it. Same thing, I came in. I believe in the work that Jacobs did, but I also read through those proposals. And uh, I tell you, that that's not easy reading, either. Uh, that's a lot of reading, just like you said, uh, Lacey. That's a lot of reading. Uh, but I feel that uh, we were fair and equitable throughout this whole process. And, and I think the uh, scores were very telling even from the proposals and then even from the interviews because I wasn't sure uh, that it wasn't uh, going to happen that way, but it, but it actually did. And, and I think it's because we all just listened to what uh, was said. And there was a uh, distinct difference between. And as Mr. Lee stated, um, I feel I went into it with a completely open mind. But again, it's something even if you have something up there, you want what's in the best interest of the students and for the district. So. Um, I truly feel that it did come down to the best representative for the review of the proposals and through the interview process. I think that's a uh, very good question that you asked, and, and my answer is going to be somewhat different, I think, a little bit more objective. I became an engineer in 1982. I have reviewed 
and participated on s several hundred selection boards. This is not my first time reviewing a proposal. I participated in selection of multi-billion dollar uh, construction design projects. Uh, the selection for this program management service was based on both the quality of the proposals that were submitted. They were all done independently. Uh, and each proposal stood or fell on its own merit. Likewise, the interviews stood separate from what was presented in writing in the proposals. So I'm confident that the best qualified program manager management service is being recommended to the board. And again, I state that on over 30 years as a uh, professional engineer. Mrs. Cassidy. So I was one of the board members that was approached and asked to be a part of the RFP committee. And I was actually kind of looking forward to learning a lot more about this process and being a part of it. Um, I was not on the board for any of the phase one. So I have to echo some of the sentiments of um, Ms. Ms. Ryan. Um, I do wish that we someone from our board did have a seat at the table during this process because I think that um, this whole entire phase two bond, I mean, we've played a large role. We have been out there for months selling it and getting excited about it ourselves. And I, you know, I know I am immensely excited about what's coming um, for our entire district. So I, I do have to echo some of those sentiments. I do wish that the process would have slowed down quite a bit. Um, I've done a little bit of research on the process and, and I know that it can be anywhere from two weeks to six weeks that you know the proposal deadline is out there for companies to to have um, and then there's different time frames that the review process takes place uh, I don't have any issue with Jacobs um, I do somewhat like the idea of the experience and I don't doubt that you folks took time to review them and and wholeheartedly you know, thought about each each and every piece that you're reviewing. And as Ms. Merica said, I don't know that I would want to score them. I don't know. That would be pretty difficult. But I do just want to at least acknowledge that I, I wish we had slowed the process down a little bit. Um, it would have been something that I think would have been valuable to have a little bit of input from one or two board members. Mr. Smith. Um, on the economic inclusion component, um, we got that percentage of the 7% but being that initial um, benchmark, what does that actually look like as far as companies or employees or how does that breakdown really um, come to play? So I do not have the chart with me. I do have a chart that identifies the percentage and numbers of, uh, so here's about my, there are about 125 Tier 1 and Tier 2s, if I'm not mistaken, the 66 Tier 1s, there would be small emerging businesses that are located east of 72nd Street. The remaining 40 or so uh, Tier 2s could be uh, small and emerging businesses any place throughout the United States. Okay. And again, I don't have the numbers in front of me, so I don't know what the exact dollars are. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yep. But that total comes to like 41.6 million for the tier one and tier twos combined. And that money stayed in our community? Tier one and tier two combined. So tier two would be companies outside of the state of Nebraska mm -hmm. or west of, I should say, west of 72nd. 72nd Street. Okay. 72nd Street, yes. Okay, thank you. And just briefly. Mr. Perlman. I, sorry, I, I was just going to mention we. I asked that question a few months ago. It was emailed out, so we'll make sure to forward that to you. It's broken all down. Mr. Ray had sent that out, mm -hmm. so. Mm -hmm. uh, for Tier 1 and Tier 2, or inclusion. Correct. Um, yeah, so. I could get that chart to Mr. Ray after the board meeting. I mean, following up on that, if you're going to do that, I would strongly suggest if you're going to break it down separate tier one from tier two and do the percentage because i think i did that tier two significantly tier two significantly higher than tier one in that breakdown so if you could when you break down tier one and tier two actually show the percentage of what tier one received 
compared to tier two out of the 41 million. No problem. Mr. Scanlon. While you're breaking that down, could you also maybe include um, the Construction Academy that happened under 2014 phase one bond and what was done under the 1999 uh, bond for Construction Academy and uh, I think we went out, I believe we used Davis companies and we paid them uh, probably a pretty penny. Look into that and okay. tell us how much we paid them and how much uh, we actually got in return on investment versus the 2014 wow. using the Construction Academy and the um, Jacobs uh, Bond Program. Will do. Thank you. So those are, some of those are in Ms. Merica. Um So in, if you refer, just for everyone who's asking about the tier one and tier two commitments and expenditures and the separation between the two, that is part of the CBOC and phase one bond update from our June 4th board meeting. Um, it's slide five. And the, the tier one commitment at that time, because there could have been some contracts since then, the tier one at that time was 10.7 million, tier two was 31 million. Thank you. So um, I will echo the sentiment at the table with some of my colleagues. Uh, I respect you all in your fields and your work. Um, uh, but what I was expecting was a RFP guru group. Uh, and I'm not saying that you guys have bias, had bias going in, um, but just my feeling if someone's going into a project or an interview process and they know that individual uh, and that individual is currently working with them, it, sometimes whether you believe it or not, it is kind of hard to separate the two, especially if they're doing a great job. Um, so there's nothing taken against you guys on that, but that is just my feeling on that. Um, and also they set the stage for stage two. So it's uh, obviously when they're talking about kids, they, they know us, so they're gonna come in and present that. Um, I wish that we did more than seven days. Um, I wish we had board members on that selection process. And it's not getting into the weeds, it's not. Um, it's being a part of the process. Um, because tonight you guys are expecting us to vote yes on your recommendation. If we go back to the Budget Advisory Committee, we had board members on that committee. And that wasn't seven days. And it went from a committee to the board before we made a decision. Um, and obviously when you come to projects like this, this is, con this is a very political topic when you're selecting a program manager. Uh, I was here when we talked about 7%. I was the board member saying 10%. Uh, and the, everyone looked at me and said I was crazy. I had people in my own community come up here and say that I was crazy. I'm not lying to you guys. Um, and we're at 11%. So kudos to Jacobs on that. Do I think they should do more in Tier 1? Yes, because Tier 1 is North and South Omaha, East 72nd Street. Um, tier 2, I mean, it's, it is what it is. Um, but that, that is what I would have expected more. Um, I would say that in my community, some of the projects, uh, the school right over here, it wasn't always as shiny as Dr. Turnquist knows and Mark Warnicke knows. Uh, and that's the community I live in, and that's the community I'm gonna raise my kids in, uh, and that's the school I'm gonna send my kids to. Uh, and it wasn't always pretty. Um, we did have to get it ironed out. I had to get involved. The dish, Mr. Evans had to call a meeting, and we did iron out. I would say that. The overall look for me on this isn't about whether Jacobs is a great company or not. I think they, hands down, will do a great job. I think any company, if you, when you talk about a $400 million project, their name is on it, so they want to do a great job. I think anybody will do a great job, especially if they do this for a living. I just think that, in my opinion, whether you guys believe it or not, I do not believe that the process was as unbiased as many people would think so. So that's just my opinion on that. Um, what unintentional bias, so not intentional. So um, with that, any other comments? Mr. Ray. 
roll call. No, there's no motion. There's no motion. Sorry. Sorry. I forgot. I thought there was a motion. I should have put up a motion first. Mr. Scanlon. I move to approve the evaluation team's recommendation for phase two bond program management services to be awarded to Jacobs Project Management Company. There's a motion by Mr. Scanlon. Is there a second? Second. Second by Mrs. Godding. Discussion? Mr. Perlman. Uh, just briefly, um, you know, it's, it's, I just find it interesting that, that the notion of conflict comes up. And the more I sit here and think about it, you know, a, a conflict, the appearance of a conflict is the same as a conflict in, in the, when you talk about conflicts in, in the world of conflicts. And so when we talk about having a couple of board members on, on the team, there's in no way a conflict, especially when you're talking about board members who have no history at all. Um, do I think there's an actual conflict? No, not at all. Absolutely not. But when we have uh, an evaluation team that is full of people who have a preconceived notion of how well one of the project manager applicants is going to do, in my mind, I'm just speaking for myself, I don't know how anyone can say that there's not an appearance of a conflict. So uh, I think Jacobs would do wonderful. I've had no problem whatsoever with what they've done, but process matters rules matter, appearance of conflicts matter, and uh, when we're talking about spending millions of taxpayer money, we have to make sure that we are completely free of any appearance of conflict. And that wasn't done here, so I'll be voting no. Ms. Marico. So I, I've just been sitting here thinking, and if we apply the same logic that we're applying, that anyone who has worked with someone who's applying for something shouldn't play a part in it, the superintendent wouldn't be able to select principals because the superintendent knows about the staff who are applying for the position. They're going into that with a bias. And I think, Mr. Lee, you said sometimes you go in thinking this person's going to be the best and the other person just completely outperforms them. Um, I've seen that in interviews in my office and in other career fields too. Um, I honestly, I, I understand um, some of our board members frustration about the fact that it was only a seven day time period. But honestly, it, this is a big multi-million dollar project. If you are a company that does this type of work, this should have been on your radar since last year when we started talking about this project. And you should have been building a portfolio of what your bid, what what your plan was, what your bid was going to include, what you're going to highlight about your company, and have that ready and waiting so that when that RFP came out, you could make your tweaks, include anything that was in the RFP that you didn't anticipate, and get it submitted. This isn't news that OPS was doing a $400 million bond issue. We've been talking about it since 2014, quite honestly. Um, so that that's just my feeling of I think it is enough time because this is the type of work that you're not starting from scratch. You have a plan in place. You're watching, you see, oh, OPS passed a bond issue. They're gonna be putting out an RFP. I need to be watching for it. Thank you. <clears throat> Any other discussion? Mr. Mr. Ray, roll call. Perlman? No. Ryan? No. Scanlon? Aye. Smith? No. Snow? No. Cassidy? No. Godding? Aye. Hallman? No. America? Aye. Three aye. Six no. Motion fails. Um, Mr. Evans, could you? Well, I think the next steps would be redoing a, the RFP, which just as a point of reference, it will put all the projects, the timelines are not going to shift on all projects, but that's okay. I mean, we've got to move forward however we move forward. Um, so we'll come back to the board with a new process um, and we'll bring that back to the board. We'll talk to the board officers and we'll bring it back to the board first meeting in July, I think, so we can move it as, again, we want to get moving as quick as possible because we've got a Gantt chart and some expectations from the public that are going to be hard to meet, uh, but we'll we'll do the best we can. So we'll bring that back the first meeting in July. Thank you, Mr. Evans. Moving on to the next 
item uh, change, oh, J1B 2018 appointments of Don Jones to the Osters Board of Trustees. I believe this was a consent item that was pulled off um, by a member of the board, um, Mrs. Godding. So I just wanted, to, I thought back about how this process works in state statute and OSERS, and I know that it's um, a bit, uh, there's a lot of statute out there. So just for clarification, state statute allows for two business individuals to be placed on the OSERS board. These are the only two individuals for which the Board of Education gives final approval. These two positions represent the community at large and in many ways are representing the taxpayers of this community. The other positions are all elected by their constituencies, OSERS, Local 226, and the retired staff. The, the approval of the two business individuals is a responsibility which we as a board should not take lightly. We've spent, as a board, a significant amount of time in the last few months working through budget cuts, some of which most definitely impact classroom learning. It's my understanding that Mr. Evans put forth a motion at a recent OSERS board meeting to reduce travel expenses. Mr. Evans, how did Mr. Jones vote on that? Um, he did not vote in support of reducing any travel expenses or professional development expenses. I believe it was only myself and Delane Havlicek. Okay. And I'm not sure if the board is aware, but the state investment officer only sends one or two people to the same conference that OSER sends seven individuals to. Compare that to the state of California, which sends three individuals to the conference, compared to us sending seven through OSERS. And remember that the OSERS board is no longer responsible for investments. Consider also that the OSERS board attends two conferences a year. I feel very responsible to represent my constituents on this vote and they are asking for responsible spending. Mr. Jones has approved the OSERS budget, which includes significant increases in legal and lobbying costs, as well as not reining in travel expenses. This is not anything personal against Mr. Jones, but on behalf of my constituents, I cannot approve another term for Mr. Jones. And I also believe that the OSERS Board of Trustees recently approved a 3% increase is that right or moved for that, Mr. Evans? How did how was I believe that? that's built into the budget. Uh, I'll have to ask uh, the I'll have to ask staff there to see, but I, I believe that's in the budget. I don't think they've actually approved for any increases. But that's the conversation the, that's happening. Yeah, I believe it's in the well, budget. Well, we're well, we're talking about um, not giving raises, and so I just want to remind everyone that these two positions are our responsibility to the community. They do represent the taxpayers. They spend a significant amount of taxpayer money and they have had oversight of that. And um, yet not being elected, we as the elected body are to make this decision. And so because of um, just the, the past voting, I have to represent my taxpayers on this who um, represent a significant portion of the taxes paid in this district and have asked me to rein in spending um, specifically related to OSERS. Mr. Scanlon. I would like uh, Superintendent Evans to uh, elaborate on the last meeting. Uh, I believe there was a newspaper article or th there was a meeting either this past month or the month before uh, that um, the OSERS Board of Trustees um, did not agree to reduce their budget, did not agree to reduce traveling uh, uh, funds. Could you, um, you, you being a member of the OSERS Board of Trustees uh, as the superintendent, could you address um, or just at least allow the public to understand um, what happened at that meeting? I'm sorry to interrupt, but I don't think this is in front of our, our board right now. Where, if, if I understand that what is in front of us is the election of one trustee to the OSERS board, how is this germane? Well, what I'm asking is the, um, how are the board members, OSERS board of trustees, how are they uh, responding? I can't look to 
elect somebody or, or approve somebody to be elected if they're not um, being a responsible member of that board of trustees. So are we just speaking about this one trustee here then? I am asking for clarification about a past board meeting where, uh, as Luann just had asked, how did this person vote? And I want more information about the OSER's uh, budget, OSER's Board of Trustees budget, and their travel uh, budget. And this member that we're considering had voted in favor of not decreasing the budget and not decreasing the travel. So that's where I'm asking for clarification. And I was not at that meeting. So the superintendent who sits on the OSER's Board of Trustees, I would like more information from him. Um, it, it is a public record. All the votes are public records, just like school board meetings. So anything I'm sharing about a public vote is all available, actually, if, if anyone was interested in how anyone voted. Uh, in relationship to that particular meeting, there was a lengthy conversation. Um, and Delane Havlovic and myself were very supportive of decreasing costs, including travel costs. And we did have a, a motion on the floor with all of the trustees, including Mr. Jones, and it was defeated. Uh, and Delane and I were the only ones that voted in favor of the motion to d decrease uh, some of the travel costs. And just to look closely at all budget items, there was a pretty lengthy conversation that I think you could actually find on the podcast or, or some of the notes that would talk about Mr. Jones' position as well as everyone else that was in the room, since it is public record. We do have, there was a decrease in one of the positions. Uh, I believe we had a retirement in the office, and so they have not replaced that retirement in the office. So there was a decrease there, but there were no decreases in, I think um, part of the conversation was cost of legal counsel, cost of the lobbyist, and travel cost, and those were not decreased. Thank you. My concerns come from the fact that, um, <coughs> excuse me, that as a board, we have a lot of recommendations brought to us. Um, we have recommendations from curriculum, as was stated earlier. Um, when curriculum is brought to us, none of us are experts at curriculum. We rely on our staff. Um, if they continually brought us bad recommendations uh, for curriculum and um, we would lose we would probably lose faith in their recommendations we'd lose trust in their recommendations currently the OSERS Board of Trustees has brought a number of recommendations to the board where we none of us are financial experts in investments uh, they brought recommendations to um, sell at a low in the uh, stock market, to get more involved in uh, alternative investments that have proven over time to be um, a significant loss to our employees' pension fund. Uh, we have um, requested, or in this past, uh, the past comments that the superintendent had, uh, that superintendent had tried to uh, bring reason to the OSERS Board of Trustees and say, you know what, we have a lot of, bu lot of budgets c budget cuts coming up. We need to reduce our budget. We have a significant unfunded liability, which uh, spending more money as the OSERS Board of Trustees continues to take away from the retirement benefits and then, then uh, causes a larger unfunded budget liability. Um, I, and also, as Superintendent Evans has said, um, you know, they will not reduce their, their uh, travel budget. They're traveling to places uh, for conferences that do not um, relate to their current responsibilities. They're no longer responsible for investments, yet they travel to um, conferences to talk about investments and talk about um, you know, investment strategies, that is no longer their responsibility. Their budget is, I believe, about, it's over $1 million. Uh, I want to say it's $1.3 million. And when the uh, Nebraska Investment Council was here, who oversees a great deal larger amount of dollars for investments, I believe their 
uh, budget was $2 million. So we have uh, a huge amount of costs that are going into this uh, OSER's uh, Board of Trustees uh, budget, their travel. Um, I personally have lost faith in their recommendations. I do not think that, um, I, I just don't think that they are uh, providing recommendations in the best interest of our employees, our members of that pension. And I cannot support um, the recommendation of a person that has contributed to those bad recommendations. We need significant change. We had to make uh, $29, $30 million worth of budget cuts, and a large portion of that was because of bad investment choices that were brought to the board for recommendation, and there's that OSER's, um, I think, you know, this year, 19 million. Next year, it just continues to uh, go up. I think we need to, as a board, take responsibility and start saying, hey, we need to fix this. So I cannot support um, any recommendation that is brought to me by the OSER's Board of Trustees. Mr. Perlman. Um, can someone tell me how long Mr. Jones has been a trustee? I think three years. Yeah, so this when we were on the committee. So this would be his first re-election, if you will? Correct. He, he came on to the um, OSER's Board of Trustees on a 5-4 vote from the Board of Education three years ago. In 2013? And so... Well, 20... Probably 15. 14, maybe. Okay. 14, 15, something like that. So is he the sh shortest serving OSER's trustee? Well, he would be... Uh, well, Delane Havlick is probably, maybe, I'm not sure what dates. I don't have the dates that each of them came on. But, to, uh, right, I think Delane is probably more new to the board than Mr. Jones. But again, remember state statute. So state statute leaves the process in place for how the OSERS person, persons are brought on. So there are two persons for OSERS. Those are voted on, and there was recently an election between Mr. Purdy and Mr. Ray for that position, um, and Mr. Purdy won that one. And so in three years, I assume, will be the next, that the Delane's position would come up. And then also 226 makes their vote um, on the position for Jim, Jim Ripa currently serves in that position. And then the retirees have their election, which is Roger Ray. So they come at different points in time, right. but we don't have any say to the other part. Um, but the two business individuals do represent the community and they represent the taxpayers. And so therefore we, as the elected body, are the ones that have to make that decision and it is our responsibility to take that um, very seriously. And that's Mr. Jones and who's the other? Mr. Jones and Mr. Erickson. Okay. And so another question I have is, is your, you or your community, uh, Ms. Gottings, objection to Mr. Jones' uh, appointment to the board strictly his opposition to um, cut back travel spending or are there other things? Well, as I mentioned in my comments, it's, it's legal, it's lobbying, it's travel expenditures. I mean, it's a whole um, array of looking at the budget and actually being responsible with those dollars. So those dollars represent taxpayer dollars and teacher right. pay that has been, gone in and staff pay that has gone into that budget. And any little bit saved. I mean, I think last year they spent 40000 on travel. I can tell you that their legal fees have increased significantly since the investments moved away. When we were doing investments, that would have been the most expensive portion of legal, but now their legal is even higher than it had been. And they never had a lobbyist before, but now they have a lobbyist as well. And have you checked to see how Mr. Jones has voted on all those sorts of different concerns? So I've been, a, I was a part of it until a year ago, two years ago, okay. and he's always voted as Mr. Um, He's voted on the budget to approve it. Okay. Um, um, I guess I guess my, my last thing is more of a comment than a question, because in 2012, 2013 school year, 
Omaha Public Schools from their general fund spent $451,000 on travel. Um, four years later, that ballooned almost 100% to $885,000 in Omaha Public Schools general fund travel spending, um, a 95% a or so increase in, in four years. And next year, we are recommending a $200,000 reduction in that. And that's something that everyone, I think, on this board supported at our last board meeting. Is that accurate? So what I would say to that comment is that when I came onto this board, and I think Mr. Evans could echo that as well, what we discovered was that the professionals in the district had not had the opportunity to attend professional development. And so for the first time, we started sending folks to Council of Great City Schools for, um, I remember specifically, the finance. And when they went, they were overwhelmed with what they learned, and they brought back significant changes to uh, I mean, that's where they found open book, and it's where they found other ideas and things that they needed to correct. And so what we discovered was that um, there hadn't necessarily been a lot of high-quality professional development within urban um, school systems that, that our staff had had the opportunity to learn from. And I think that's part of the reason. I can't tell you why the whole reason is that um, travel increased so significantly. But what I can tell you about OSERS is they're no longer managing investments. But as Mr. Um, Scanlon said, they're still attending investment conferences. State of California, three people. Three people for the whole state of California. Our little community sends seven, from what I understand. Um, so I just want to make sure that we're responsible too. We had the state investment officer here. He said, what, one or two people? that he sends to that same conference. So let's compare that one. Um, and yet we send everybody for something we no longer do in-house. Well, do we know where they're traveling to, where this money's going to? I believe the last one was Arizona. Is it for, for professional development? Have you looked at the agenda of what they were doing there? Uh, for investment, investment uh, topics. Okay, my, I guess my last question, was this a unanimous vote on the part of the OSERS trustee board to appoint Mr. Jones? I think if you read the agenda, I think it was. Is okay. that correct, Mr. Ray? I think it, that's what it says if you read the agenda item. Ms. Merica. So I, I cannot remember how I voted in 2013. Um, and I did not go back and check, just to be clear. Um, and I have to admit, I, if you had asked me last week, I was kind of like, you know, let's just appease OSERS and vote for this because I am, <laughs> and I'm trying to stay calm, I am so sick and tired of the back and forth that has been going on between the OSERS Board of Trustees and our board. We have a problem. We both, we both helped cause it, and I think, our board recognized that, that yes, the district should have been paying ARCs even when OSERS wasn't saying we need an ARC payment. And we've been addressing that for the past few years. We've been working with the legislature. We've been trying to find solutions. And we have been fought tooth and nail at every turn. Um, as Mrs. Godding said, we've seen the OSERS board increase their legal fees. We've seen them add positions over the past few years. We've seen them add a lobbyist. In the past week, I've had people send me things that they said came from the Board of Trustees that specifically say, at some point in the previous seven to 10 years, the OPS administration stopped making its ARC payments. Employees continued to pay in, but our employer did not. That's a blatant, untrue statement because OPS was still paying into OSERT. We were still making our required employer contribution there was no ARC payment happening because the OSERS board wasn't requesting an ARC payment. I hear over and over again, well, OPS board approved the investments. The OPS board approved the investments that didn't work out so well. They did. We did. And when we questioned an investment in, and it was an alternative investment in, I think, underwater mortgage property in New Jersey and Illinois, and we questioned it and said, why are we putting so much more money into this fund? What's going on here? We're not seeing returns on this. 
again, we were fought tooth and nail of why are you questioning us? Why are you questioning our investment authority and our investment decisions? Um, it, it's tiring and frustrating. And I don't know that I can vote for someone who's been actively supporting and participating in that and hasn't been making changes or hasn't been willing to say, you know what, let's acknowledge we've both made mistakes, let's work together going forward. Because um, I feel like that's where our board is. We want to work together. We want to find a solution to this problem. Um, we don't want to have to keep cutting millions of dollars from our budget every year. And that's just where I am right now. Um, I'm a little frustrated and I don't know that I can support returning people who haven't been open to change to that board again. Mr. Perlman. Uh, I appreciate those comments. Um, they should have happened five or six years ago. But my question is, uh, what happens if we don't approve this appointment? Mr. Evans, I think we discussed that. No, I was talking to Ms. America, I apologize. Uh, that I believe they would have to redo the process again and bring us a different recommendation. Or they could bring the same recommendation and explain why. I just didn't know if there was another uh, uh, alternate person, perhaps. And, and I'm not sure, but I'm, I don't think anybody else participated. I think they were just ex renewing his yeah. and not having him bid out or something like that. Um, I would say going into this, I, I've, I all, I'm a firm believer in shared, shared responsibility. Um, I really do believe that our board, our district, our teachers, our community members have agreed that uh, we have to tighten our belt and we've stepped up and we've uh, reduced our budget $29,535,000. Um, and I really do believe in that shared responsibility, uh, the Omaha School Employees Retirement System must do the same. I'm not a big fan of slinging mud, but this is an appointment that this board has control over um, appointing this individual. Um, and Mr. Scanlon, you hit the nail on the head uh, when you explained it, and uh, I thank you for that, as well as Mrs. Godding. Uh, uh, I echo Mrs. America, Ms. America's sentiment, um, and I will be voting no in this recommendation as well. Mr. Ray, roll call. There's no motion. All right, man, we talked too much. Is there a motion? See, I, I, I move to uh, nominate. To appoint uh, Don to, Jones to, appoint to the Don OSU's Jones. Board of Trustees. Yes. There's a motion by Mr. Perlman. Is there a second? Second. Second by Mr. Smith. Discussion? Yes. Again, just briefly, um, I actually voted, or I made the nomination just to have some more discussion. <laughs> um, I want to thank Ms. Godding because of all the board members who have been through this whole process. I think you uh, have should be getting the most credit for, for stopping this nonsense um, that should have been stopped in probably 2010. Um, I just wish that uh, more board members would have stood up and said something instead of just not attending the meetings. Um, and um, maybe this hole we find ourselves in wouldn't be nearly so large. Um, so I, I will be voting no. I, I think there needs to, you know, just like I think with our district, there needs to be more than, you know, a, a little bit of uh, uh, austerity, if you will. Um, our, our budget shortfall is more than 29 million. We use 26 million dollars in savings. Um, so uh, I will be voting no. Uh, again, it's unfortunate that the same level of scrutiny that we're giving to this one person for not objecting to travel spending wasn't done uh, to the uh, outrageous investment decisions that were um, rubber stamped for so many years that has now led to laying off people and cuts all throughout our district. And Mr. Pullman, you're talking about decisions made by previous boards. Yeah, I wasn't. Fair. Most of us I weren't just, here. No, I don't. Yeah. 
uh, none of us were here when those decisions were made. Those were. You're absolutely right. I, I you need to clarify. Okay. Yes, when those when those investment decisions uh, that got us here, it, Fair. absolutely. That's Thank a good you. point. Any other discussion? Mr. Ray, roll call. Ryan. No. Scanlon. No. Smith. No. Snow. No. Cassidy. No. Godding. No. Holman. No. America. No. Perlman. No. Motion fails. Moving on to item J1C, change order to number one, secondary success, relocation, renovation phase one. And I do believe the Dr. Tarnkos will explain. Mrs. Mrs. Godin, I think you were the one that pulled it. Okay, off. so I was the one that pulled it, and I pulled it because I thought line three, and I don't know if anybody else had that same confusion when they read this item, but I thought that line three was really confusing, and I interpreted it to mean something that I've since found out it doesn't mean. But I think from a public standpoint, we should probably have that clarified. So. I don't know if it's Dr. Turnquist or I think Mr. Warnicky. Mr. Warnicky, just to explain it, and and for the public's um, perspective, the item says um, it's the last line. This is a change in scope to move this work from phase two into phase one. So I interpreted it to mean from phase two bond into the phase one bond, and I was concerned that we were moving money around <coughs> before we were even done the second bond tranches and we don't have our list of how much our savings were and so um, I have since found out that that isn't at all what this means but can you just clarify so sure. that we all understand and maybe we need to make sure what, going forward we're sure clear what this is is just, basically I think the, some of us are I apologize uh -huh. we just all want to make sure that we're looking at the same thing where precisely are we at? so if you pull up the agenda item for change order number zero zero one and if you go down to the third box the last line in the third box under the one million one hundred and sixty three thousand says this is a change in scope to move this work from phase two into phase one um, that caught my attention when I was looking at the agenda um, and getting ready for tonight's meeting. And so um, I did ask Matt to pull it just so we could have clarification on exactly what that means. Sure. <clears throat> uh, back in May of 2017, we brought to the board a uh, proposal to remodel uh, the original Druid Hill School for the secondary success uh, program. Uh, we were losing our lease at St. Mary's um, School. Uh, I believe it's July of this year. We had to give notice, so we were moving the pro we needed a place to go. When we brought it to the board, we broke it into two phases. Uh, phase one, which we were remodeling the 1965 addition to that building, which was doing classroom renovations, office improvements, uh, nurse area, and different parts of that, excuse me, different parts of the building. And then phase two was the original part of the building. We were putting air conditioning in, we were doing some ADA improvements, we were improving the classrooms and really upgrading the mechanical system. Uh, at this time, we thought we could move all the mechanical equipment that was pushed off into phase two in under phase one. Uh, the phase one price came in under budget. Uh, we felt that this is a good time uh, to go ahead and include all the new boilers uh, new chillers for air conditioning, uh, heat pumps in all the classrooms. Um, I believe it said electrical gear, switch gear. So it was really the improvement of all the mechanical and electrical systems that we were pushing off in phase two. Since we're under budget and this is site and building funds, move it into phase one and we get more mechanical and electrical work done underneath this phase and still keep the project going. I think that's a really great point. What you just said, it was it's under what budget the site the phase one part of it came in but it's under, under but it's not it, it doesn't have anything to do with phase one of the bond correct nor does it have anything to do with phase two of the bond this is part of the fund that um we still have a little bit of money Special left over in, funds, right the site, and building, fund. site building, the site building. And building fund can be used only for renovations Capital and not for new construction no, it can be used for new construction major renovations and remodeling work and purchase of sites and it was um, 
it came about years and years ago when we had extra money, is that correct? And a portion of the bond, or a, part, a portion of our levy was put into this particular fund. Yeah, is that the right one or is that a different well, fund? Well, site and building is a special building levy that can, can be assessed and it's been going on for probably 50 years. I mean, it's been, I haven't been in the district that long, but it's been around as long as I have. Uh, and we've built all kinds of new schools with it. We've purchased property with it. We've done major renovations, major additions, parking lots, uh, anything that you can define as capital improvement, roof replacements, chiller replacements, boiler improvements. And I, th I think, if, if I'm right, and maybe I need to ask Mr. Evans this question because I know Connie's not here tonight, but I think on tonight's financial statements, that fund is now down to about $8 million. Is that right? Because we haven't been putting money in. Obviously, we right. don't have any money to put yeah. in. And we do have one check that we're still waiting on. We sold the old JP Lords okay. to, and they're right. paying that in installments, and so that's still coming in. But other than that, you're right. Uh, other than the payments for the sites we sold to UNMC, including Parish as well. Correct. Yeah, so so the, that'll help some. So, but so that did actually pay for Fullerton, I think. Yes. Back in the, back in the day, mm -hmm. um, that fund when I started on the board was quite a bit higher. I mean, I want yeah. to say 20 plus million, but we've been using it and chipping it away. Um, so when it's gone, there won't maybe be any. Yeah, there. we have projects that were started this year and we'll be finishing up in the next fiscal year. So we'll need, uh, we've been talking to Connie to make sure there's funds there to finish up projects like this, uh, the original Druid Hill and some of the other projects that we started. I just don't want, because Druid Hill was a big conversation about whether that was actually in phase one. I don't want anybody to be confused and that's yeah. why I pulled it off. When it says phase one and phase two, it doesn't it's have anything to do with the bond. It's, it's project a site, specific. site and building yeah. fund. So. And it's specific to this project because Drew Correct. Hill or the original Drew Hill was defined as in two parts. We had to do it over two fiscal years. Thank you. Um, I will entertain a motion to approve the recommendations. Um, I move to approve change order number 001, secondary success program relocation renovation, phase one-ish and two-ish. <laughs> second. We have a motion by Mrs. Godding, second by Mr. Smith. This has nothing to do with the phase one or phase two bonds. Uh, any discussion? Comments? Roll call, please. Scanlon. Aye. Smith? Aye. Snow? Aye. Cassidy? Aye. Godding? Aye. Pullman? Aye. America? Aye. Perlman? Aye. Ryan? Aye. Nine, nine. Motion carries. Moving on to item J1D, first reading, policy 4035. And I do believe this was presented at our previous board meeting. That's correct. Um, it's one of the three policies that we brought forward last time as information. This is the only policy that uh, we're bringing forward now. We're seeking input on the other policies. If you look on uh, F on page two of three, uh, Mrs. Godding asked us to clarify that second paragraph. So the blue reflects the changes that were um, brought to you before as an information item. And then the red were changed uh, to kind of update one of the points that Mrs. Godding brought up. We added his or her designee and then we clarified the language to be what we actually do rather than uh, the wording that was there in the past. Thank you. Yes, Mr. Scan. Oh, sorry. Mr. Scan. I had a question. Um, just, uh, I wasn't here for the first, first go round, but uh, in, um, on paragraph C, uh, we uh, state that they, that the uh, contractor has to use the E-Verify program, which is a, um, federal program mm -hmm. uh, and then the next paragraph um, it, it says that the subcontractor used an electronic verification system are, are we giving an option not to use e-verify for subcontractors versus contractors or is there any reason that should not state um, the e-verify e program Sure. Um, Megan's coming up to help with that question. So you're looking at page one, that second paragraph in C, and then uh, what would be D? Is that right, Mr. Uh, I'm looking at, uh, well, I guess I didn't get down to, 
I guess anywhere that it that it, it the verification program that we initially state the e-verify program be utilized and then we kind of change our, um, our our lingo to just say electronic ver verification system whereas just being familiar with the e-verify that's a very specific one uh, we currently do e-verify -ver e for all of our bond projects would there be any problem changing that uh, lingo uh, in that second uh, C paragraph instead of electronic verification to e-verify and maybe even uh, making it using the federal um, uh, I don't know federal program e-verify or the federal e-verify program just so we are making sure that I mean that's a, a well accepted by the states and federal governments uh, to utilize that program are we opening it up ourselves if we change that lingo by not saying e-verify? I, I, I mean, that's the process that we're required by law to use. Uh, I, you know, I don't think your policy necessarily changes uh, the process that the law provides. We have to follow the law. Um, your, your policy is not as specific as to the system. You can certainly make it more specific if you wanted to make it more specific. Um, but uh, we're, we're talking about what matches from a statutory language st standpoint. Um, so that's the language that's provided in 4 114. Ms. Merica. To, to clarify, because that, that was the question I had when you said that too. Does 4 114 say use an electronic verification system? Correct. Okay. But does that mean the federal e-verify program? Yes. Okay, so maybe we can just have our policy reflect that it's the e-verify program, change that lingo so then there's no uh, confusion that if somebody comes up with a different electronic verification or opens it up we to... We could put it in parentheses and say e-verify. I'd be happy with that. Okay. So, um, any other, sorry, any other comments or questions? So, we would have to make a motion to no, add that. Clarifies it. Correct? Yes. yes. Mr. Scanlon? <laughs> would you like to make a motion to add that in there? I move to approve the first reading of policy 4035 with the amended uh, verbiage of e-verify program anywhere that is referred to as an electronic verification program. Is there a second? Second. Second by Dr. Holman. Discussion? Roll call. Smith? Aye. Snow? Aye. Cassidy? Aye. Godding? Aye. Holman? Aye. America? Aye. Perlman? Aye. Ryan? Aye. Scanlon? Aye. Nine, aye. Motion carries. So back to the original motion. Um, any? That was no. done, no, no. No. No, that was? That covered both. Then um, apologize. Yes. I appreciate that. We're going to miss you from shortening the meetings. Moving on to item, uh, information item, J2A, OPS Minnesota Humanities Center Education Strategy. Center Education Strategy. Mr. Sharif Thawaru, are you our only presenter tonight? I apologize for making you wait so long. I was not, but I am now. Oh. <laughs> as, as the time went on, there were less and less additional. However, I do have friends, so they'll come up and, and sit behind me. You guys wouldn't mind, MJ? And this way I don't look so lonely. I don't do this work <laughs> alone.
So good evening and thank you for having uh, us here and asking us to present related to uh, our uh, educational strategy with Minnesota Humanities Center. Um, I have about half hour 45 minutes worth of stuff, uh, but I will condense that down to 10 minutes, 25, 10, Fit. you know, you can't keep the 10 minutes. <laughs> so you stop playing. <laughs> Mr. Ray, time clock, please. <laughs> Anything longer than 10 minutes is all y'all. You know this. <laughs> <laughs> so in our um, work um, in our district related to equity and diversity, related to inclusion, um, our strategy with Minnesota Humanity Center has always been one of um, engaging in addressing not directly the um, academic achievement gap, it's really the relationship gap that we're working with. Um, developing a relationship with the students, um, between staff, and the strategy is one that's humanities based. And so this leaves us to be able to come with a perspective that building and strengthening relationships between and among educators and their students, uh, between each other, between families, the community, that this is what leads to system-wide change. And so this is the what that we do with the educational strategy. The core elements of what we work with are listed here. Um, and these core elements allow us to be able to drive down into how do we increase that engagement. Um, the materials that you have that I've given to you lay out on cards information about overall what we do with Minnesota Humanity Center, but it also addresses these core values and touching on those core values of learning from and with multiple voices, building and strengthening relationships, recognizing the power of story and the danger of absence, and also included within this is the danger of having single narratives, and then also amplifying the community solution for change. And so each one of those pieces that was um, uh, available to you electronically, but here in the hard format, allows you to be able to understand, one, what is that particular core value? Secondly, what is the opposite of that? And a lot of times when we're doing research and we're looking at information, we'll look at what our efforts do. But um, this is going on to be able to expand beyond that to say this is what happens, how you know that it's present. And then without that particular element or that particular value manifested, this is what that will look like. This is what the absence of this element looks like. And so that's broken down for you by district element, by professional development category, for our schools and for our educators. Um, this was something that was done because of the fact that along this entire process, Terra Luna has been um, along with the process to be able to develop uh, and share the strategies that we work with um, through hundreds of interviews, uh, all of the um, post evaluations that are compiled every time we have uh, work that's done. On the back, you'll see the research base related to how researchers help us to understand that particular value. And then we list an example of um, where that's manifest in one of the different offerings. Uh, on this also, you'll hear, uh, you'll read a quote from um, one of our participants who shared information about the impact that it's had on them. So you get the example uh, that is there. On the right hand side there, you see that we have um, the primary areas in which our offerings would fall related to those core values, but each one of those are interconnected in such a way that um, any of those impact another area. For example, if you're looking at a school action team, that's designed to amplify the community for solutions for change. However, that also gives us uh, recognition in terms of voice of uh, other narratives that we may not be getting. Uh, it certainly helps in building and strengthening relationships, and it allows us to be able to learn from multiple voices, especially the voices from outside uh, where we have our community of uh, educators. This is uh, a listing of our educational strategy, who the people are related to Minnesota Humanity Center Project. A lot of times uh, we used to get the question, I haven't heard it in a number of uh, years, but the first year I was in was why Minnesota? Why are we getting all these people from Minnesota, bring them down here? What do they know that we don't know? When well, this particular strategy that Minnesota Humanity Center puts up, the work that they do in their humanities is a different focus area than the work that's done in the Nebraska humanities, for example. And in their focus area, they put together a team that helped us address a key and core area. But as you see within this list here, and it's um, in your electronic, you can see it even more highlighted that the vast majority of the individuals involved with this particular strategy are people from within our own district who have worked here for a number of years, retired from our district, and or currently work with our district now. 
And so in that listing, you'll see uh, individuals you know, for example, um, uh, Jim Freeman is one that has uh, still continues to assist us in the efforts uh, that we do uh, for recruitment and retention, for example. Um, and so um, the, the, the strategy for us is how do we find out what we know locally and how do we apply that um, to benefit uh, not only these are educators, these are also educators from, who understand uh, the workings of our system. Uh, so with us uh, today we have uh, Mr. Fred Marisette, uh, we have uh, Kenny Butts, we have MJ Holcomb, we have, um, who else we have? Dr. Coleman, I'm talking about local folks first. Okay, we got you. Um, that have brought in expertise, but as you see within that list here, we have uh, a powerful team put together. Our educational strategy is uh, humanity-centered uh, focus. Um, again, coming from those community of educators that are led by ed educators allows us to be able to implement a strategy that is humanity-centered. Again, this is taking a look at the what do we do. Um, it's a process, not a prod uh, uh, product. So um, basically, um, uh, you're in a situation where you will find that there is a package that you get from someone and that they're offering as experts. So that is not the way this is done here. This is a process that's done with and for the folks that are, it's benefiting, uh, that, that are benefiting from it. So our educators are involved with it, whether they're an educator that's in the classroom or an educator that's a security staff personnel. Um, the, the list is extensive and I'll go into that more. Um, another area is that it's learning oriented. So each one of the individuals involved in this process are ones that are gathering information from each other and how this process works. And they're able to bounce off each other different strategies that they're using to implement and coming to create a collective knowledge approach. Uh, we're strength based in terms of our focus. We do not come at this as a deficit. And we come on building the things that work but being brave enough to challenge the things that don't and also to be able to change directions when necessary. And we also, again, take a systems approach. This is something that is powerfully run by individuals who make personal changes in terms of the development that they're doing um, related to their personal development. But the impact of that is so that it's a systems approach. So it has to be something that is embedded throughout the, the district that allows us to be able to have a systems approach to making that change with the students. As far as OPS educators that are involved in the strategy, in the past five years, more than 26,000 participants from 92 uh, OPS schools, uh, programs, or entities. We have 21 of our current partner schools, uh, yet this is available to all of our entire district, and so therefore, we are able to get out to all of our buildings, and they've participated in all of the core offerings that we have. Going on, this takes a look at our current partner schools. There's 21 schools that are partner schools. This is where the majority of the uh, participation will come from in terms of the school has, the vast majority of their building has uh, participated in one or more offerings within that we're getting from Minnesota Humanities. Yes. And majority, is there a percentage on that to, to be a partner school or? So within the partner schools, and yes, there's a precise amount, but within the partner schools is a dedication from that school that they will work directly with the work that we're offering. Okay. And because of that, we both, they both attend the offerings that we have, as well as all of those individual schools are hosting events and activities participating within the Minnesota Humanities Center structure. So 100% of the staff are involved in some way or another in executing okay. it. I don't have the breakdown of how many come out to the uh, core element pieces of it, but all of them have, uh, in whether, whether it's a story circle, um, whether it's uh, reconstructing curriculum, innocent classrooms, there's participation, participation and customized efforts so for the like staff down within the building. The right, okay. so these ones are that's fully awesome. immersed in them. Do you want to add anything to it? That's good? Okay. It's all volunteer. Yes, and keep in mind it's all volunteer. So these pilot schools are, are, are not pilot schools, excuse me, these partner schools uh, are partner schools that have requested to be a partner within this work and their participation in it is volunteer. So there's not a mandate that everybody here has to do this, which is why when schools uh, request to be a partner school, the school administrators, et cetera, have worked with their building to ensure that this is something that they're interested in. Going on, uh, participating educators included as far as categories here. We're listing again that this is not something that's just for the classroom educator, but we come from a, a community of educators, meaning no matter what your title is on this list and others, we consider you part of the educational strategy for these young people. And that's the approach that we take. Um, the list is ex extensive, and so it goes beyond this, but this is a core element or look at what we have uh, as far as participation. 
And then as far as community collaborative partners, again, one of the focus areas that you uh, see there is that we amplify community solutions for change. We are, um, these are 46 community uh, collaborative partners that we uh, work with, and it goes beyond that when it comes to ripple effects because some of our schools are working with their own uh, community members to be able to affect change. And these are some of the core, uh, these are the 46 uh, that we've worked with over the past few years to um, support the work with Minnesota Humanities Center. Again, uh, this approach is about being a catalyst for change. Again, the humanities-centered uh, approach gives us an advantage. Uh, this is working from a, both a heart and a head type of approach, where we're blending together the different impacts in the way that we reach out to our students. Uh, so that impact of refining and transforming the teacher practice, that's really an impact focus, but we're also talking about peers being able to impact their colleagues, inspiring uh, each other in terms of the work that we do. And again, they both are growing, or each one are growing from uh, each other. Um, another element that I see within this is that we're always pushing for being able to learn from the good work that the others are doing. Again, from a strength-based focus, that means that we're concentrating on what's being done well and how do we amplify that um, and what's working for students. Um, we tie this to the school improvement plan and make sure that there's alignment within that. That is a core element about why this is so well infused within the schools and work that we do, is that it's not, again, something from the outside that's brought in, but this is something that's tied into our strategic plan and our school improvement plan. Uh, as I mentioned before, this is an individual process where each individual is looking for their personal uh, uh, development growth, but it's also a collective approach uh, as well. And that's what moves, again, another element that moves it forward. The absent narratives um, allows us to be able to understand the importance of learning that student's individual stories. The innocent classroom really concentrates on helping us to identify how do we build relationships by concentrating on a student's good. The actions that they take are based on a core good that they have. How do we tap into that and make sure that they maintain the innocence that they needed to come into our classrooms with, but that may be robbed for them, or maybe they feel as if they don't have that accessible to them. How do we find that student's good? The secrets to motivating um, uh, students, and it's expanded. We also have secrets to motivating families as well. Um, this is what we find out, what motivates and drives a student, uh, what motivates them to be engaged in the classroom, and that engagement that comes when we're able to tap into that allows us to be able to change what a student may think would be a bad experience into the, one of the best experiences they have, and that's our K-12 system here in OPS. Um, reconstructing curriculum uh, helps educators source culturally relevant teaching materials, and this is being able to make sure that we have uh, diverse classroom settings for our diverse learners, and this is both everything f related to their background, their ethnicity, uh, what they bring to the table, poverty, all of those categories being pulled together, and the reconstructing curriculum allows us to be able to identify within our curriculum what may be missing and what narratives are placed as a norm um, because we are not open to the idea that within our curriculum may be certain uh, dominant perspectives and how do we get alternate perspectives and um, teach the things that we don't realize uh, are missing and or be aware of the things that we don't realize that we are actually teaching. The immersions allow us to be able to connect educators to the communities we serve. Uh, we just finished a week-long immersion all the last week some 12-hour days between the, the daytime uh, uh, immersions as well as the evening offerings because we have summer Minnesota Humanities Center offerings. But we start off with the indigenous peoples. We go to, um, 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 and this is throughout the year, but we did a, our first time with a summer immersion. But we have indigenous people, the Korean. We look at the African uh, nations, and so the continent of Africa, and touch base on the different um, status of Africans in our community. Um, North Omaha, South Omaha, and all of this is led by the people from within that community. As a matter of fact, our Korean uh, community was presented by uh, the youngsters within the community. Uh, so it was really a youth-led uh, focus um, the entire day. Um, and then Story Circles creates a, basically a process in which our educators, our parents, um, are all able to work together to hear from each other and create a community of practice, uh, meaning you are passionate about the same things, you're passionate about the work that you do, you're working in the same environment, and how do you tie those things together? Wrapping up, I want to talk about um, some of the impact uh, that we had. Again, in the focus point of what we do, we are always talking about what do we know, who's involved, is it working, and the response to that is absolutely it is. It's having the impact that's, uh, that's desired. Um, 
in this one for the last three years, taking a look at the pre previous th three years of funding for this. 1580 OPS educators individually participated in different professional development offerings. The majority of those at 51% have voluntarily participated in two or more. Again, um, coming back for uh, participation in multiple offerings, and our offerings are multi-day. So the vast majority of our op offerings are taking place over four or six uh, different meetings, and we have retention rates that are extremely high with folks staying involved with that. But this is referring to participating in two or more separate offerings, which means they've been through one, and they're like, what's next? How do I get in that? 16% have participated in five or more uh, offerings, and I'll be honest with you, there are a number uh, who have started back at the top and said, now that I have gone through these, let me start again and be able to go to, through ones that I've already been through because now my lens is different than it was when I was a novice walking into this. Um, educators are always looking to deepen their work in the school-based communities of practice. And as you see here, um, we're talking about the impact and how the entire school gets involved. Our schools that are partners with Minnesota Humanities Center host more than 30 events a year that involve the school community, they involve students, they involve parents, and they involve family members, and we also bring in the greater Omaha community. And this is done on a consistent basis. This is not a one-off element. And the final two slides here, taking a look at the fall of 2016 offering surveys and re as, uh, respondents, we see that our um, uh, respondents are stating that there's been a huge positive impact related to the offerings. As was mentioned, if we talk about something that's happening and we want to know this work, as Mr. Evans mentioned, um, what does the data say? Are we doing better than we were before? Are we seeing improved results after the involvement? This is hearing directly from the participants and saying, when you took this back to your classroom and your environment, your, your, your role within the district, did it have an impact? Uh, and as you can see, whether it's most or some, 88% um, on student engagement, student academic growth listed as 76% when you're combining the most or some impact on a, a, a positive student engagement or academic growth. And then finally, um, the uh, impact that our educators are saying that uh, they've had, these are the top level, levels of area. Whether it's students seem to have an increased sense of belonging in the classroom, which we know will have an impact in their engagement and therefore their learning. I give students more individual attention, understanding the power of hearing their voice in the process, um, knowing where your students are coming from and being able to adjust your curriculum to be able to differentiate based on that. Uh, I am more frequently encouraged, uh, I more frequently encourage students to think critically about what they're learning. Um, I am more frequently including students' own perspectives within my curriculum, and I have, dis uh, I have a stronger relationship with some of my students. And these are our top areas, but we have quite uh, a bit more. Really, in terms of our evaluation process in this, there's certain key elements that come out. They're reflected in the cards that you have, but they uh, compiled this based on what they saw when they did evaluations and then came up with the guiding principles. It wasn't something they walked in with. One of the things that they noticed was that we we're uh, co-creative, that we did things collectively between each other and we had openness and we were always building empathy. They looked at coherence and how we tied our overall consistency of our mission as a district to the work that we're doing with Minnesota Humanities Center and that came out over and over, that coherence. Uh, commitment was demonstrated as well. Um, that our work showed in the evaluation that we have a high commitment level that values community engagement uh, uh, over time and showing accountability means it wasn't just a one-off engagement but over time a long-term commitment as far as engagement. Um, disruption and risk taking which means if you see something that's going the wrong direction we have with this process been able to disrupt that break that up and find out what are the best strategies to work with and take risk when it comes to trying to challenge some new areas and then that we're humanities based and again, as I mentioned before, that's really about deepening the experience uh, and heightening the potential for making change because of the, the heart and head are aligned with that. And then finally, the personal and professional growth, growth because change begins with individual transform transformation. And so the work that the team does is really around that individual trans transformation for creative cultural uh, competency levels. In particular, how can we make this a systems-based approach? And the humanities area allows us to be able to use the arts in a way that are not really utilized in a lot of different um, venues as much as it should, because a lot arts allow us to be able to reflect things in a way that um, sometimes the reports don't show. And even our uh, evaluation process is included an arts-based evaluation. One 
outcome of that is hanging by the elevator here on the second floor, uh, which participants uh, came together and reflected on their experiences through the arts. And they're working on right, uh, one right